Thank you, colleagues. We're going to resume uh, with our next item of business, which is continuation of Stage 3 proceedings of the Planning Scotland Bill. So, just to remind members, in dealing with uh, this bill, the members should have with them the bill as amended at Stage 2, the marshalled list, the correction slip for Amendment 3, and the grouping of amendments. And uh, as this is a second day, we will ring the division bell uh, and suspend proceedings for five minutes before the first vote of the day, the first division of the afternoon. And that will be a 30-second vote. Thereafter, there will be a one-minute vote uh, following every, the, the first vote on every debate. Uh, every other uh, vote will be 30 seconds. Um, yesterday, I tried to give members a rough idea of which were the long groups and got it spectacularly wrong. I, I had been asked by a member to indicate, and I got it spectacularly wrong, so I'm not going to do so today. However, I will indicate that we are likely to take a break um, following uh, Group 25, probably, which might be around um, half four, four o'clock, half four. That's right. And uh, we might take another break following Group 32, but we'll play that by ear and I'll try and indicate to members uh, in advance um, when we are, that's about to happen. So I would ask members to refer to the marshal list now. We're going to pick up at Group 16, which is Land Value Capture Sharing. I call Amendment 112 in the name of Graeme Simpson, grouped with Amendments 212 and 215. Graeme Simpson to move Amendment 112. Thank you. It feels like I've never been away. <laughs> um, I move Amendment 112 in my name. Um, this removes land value capture from the face of the bill. It was introduced into the bill by an amendment that I tabled at stage two. Initially, the bill had no mechanism for cap capturing any land value uplift. Um, it was a subject that the committee um, had a, a really close look at. And I think there is general cross-party support for the concept. Um, however, um, the amendment that I tabled um, has um, raised some concerns, some legal concerns, um, and you know I have to be honest about that and, and just say that I don't think there is a place for it in this bill. Um, I think I think there are there are problems with it. Um, people like the Scottish Property Federation have called it prem premature. Um, they welcome my amendment today, which removes the provision. Uh, Scottish land and estates point to um, its possible incompatibility with EHCR. Um, and that, indeed, was also a point raised by the committee that I convened, the DPLR committee. So um, I think um, that given the work that's going on by the Scottish Land Commission on this, um, this is not the place for it. So I'm happy to move that we re remove this. Uh, and on that basis, I will not be supporting Alex Rowley's amendment 212 and 215. Thank you, Mr Simpson. And I call Alec Rowley to speak to amendment 212 and the other amendments. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, in moving 212, 215, these, these amendments require ministers to lay the regulation to facilitate land value capture within 18 months of royal assent of the planning bill. Legislation to facilitate land value capture of land value sharing is, uh, as it has been usefully termed by the Scottish Land Commission, is not a silver bullet uh, that will solve our, all our current housing supply crisis. We need to adopt a much more proactive approach to public interest-led development across the board, enabling public bodies to take the lead in major development. However, land value sharing could play a key role in this. It is deeply disappointing to see that the Tories and the government team up to remove one of the transformative amendments to the bill from stage two. It should not have been beyond the government to resolve the legal change required to make this possible. We are giving the government an opportunity to cement their support for the principle of land value sharing and commit to providing the legislative framework to make it possible. 
on the time frame, we approached the government before the amendment deadline and stated that we were open to their comments and to extending the time frame if they were willing to support this amendment. So we do not accept that as an explanation for why they are refusing to accept this specific amendment. The Government has failed to make formal responses to the Land Commission's brilliant recent reports on land value sharing and failed to say whether it accepts their recommendations. Can you blame us for starting to question their commitment to it? Graeme Simpson. Um, I actually asked the uh, First Minister about this. Um, I don't know if Alex Rowley was in the Chamber when that happened. Uh, and she said there would be a, a full response to the Land Commission's report uh, after, after this bill is dealt with. So that's what the First Minister has said. And I, I'm pretty sure I heard uh, the Housing Minister say in this chamber that he actually accepted all the recommendations, but he'll be able to confirm that himself. Alec Rowley. Listen, uh, President Officer, uh, we seem to have some kind of coalition going on between the SNP and the Tories when it comes to trying to block any kind of radical proposal on, on land reform. Uh, I know who they speak for. It's now clear who they speak for. Uh, so can the Minister stay on the official report that he will legislate on land value capture as soon as is reasonably possible? I think that's a fair question to put to the Minister. And can he explain how he plans to make more publicly-led development a reality? because there would be huge benefits to both of these, despite what the Tories think. So the Minister, I hope, will answer that. The Scottish Land Commission has successfully convened the land value sharing. It's not about negating all the benefits the private sector currently get from development. It's about a public-led approach being used to create additional value that can be used to create ambitious, attractive, sustainable and healthy places that above all are built to work for communities. Surely at the heart of this bill should be communities and should be people. Many of the issues we have and will discuss this week, notably sufficiently housing for older people and disabled people, would be much more of a reality if we embrace publicly-led development, where public bodies have more influence of the minimum standards of homes being built. It is this level of transformative change that is required to realise the vision that this Parliament has, not the limited provision put forward by the Government and accepted by the Tory party. I hope that both parties will consider supporting this amendment. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I call Andy Whiteman. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome Graeme Simpson in his new role as spokesperson for the First Minister. Um, ahead, of, ahead, ahead of stage two uh, of this bill, I, I conducted a consultation on the proposal to enable local authorities to acquire land at its existing use value, a power they had from 1947 until 1959, and which would strip out a substantial part of the profit that accrues to landowners and developers from the uplift in land value. Now, developers such as Murray Estates um, who are developing a large area in the west of Edinburgh, a good example. Having secured planning consent, the company informed me in a meeting they had with me that it would actually simply just sell the land, pocketing a very tidy profit through the granting of a public good planning consent. Now, I know the government's interested in this concept, but it's had 18 months to bring forward proposals. Instead, it's kicked it into the long grass and missed the only legislative opportunity, possibly for some time, to introduce such a power. The power, as was envisaged, and I had amendment myself at stage two, which I didn't press, um, because Graham Simpson's um, had got into the bill. The powers envisaged would only apply in master plan consent areas. It was actually a very, very limited power, and we intentionally restricted that power to enable it to be uh, experimental to an extent uh, and to avoid any of the uh, bigger uh, problems that might apply if we applied it right across uh, the piece. So we were focusing this power in restricted areas, allowing councils to explore a more plan-led, public-led development model that's provided, that has provided so much success in countries like uh, Germany. Our presiding officer, we oppose the removal of Section 54CA of the bill and we're voting against Amendment 112. We'll be supporting Alec Rowley's uh, amendment, however, thank you. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, as I have 
consistently made clear uh, we as a government are interested in uh, the concept of land value capture or sharing uh, and we will explore how land value uplifts can be effectively captured uh, to fund infrastructure uh, and that's why the government asked the Scottish Land Commission uh, to investigate this issue uh, and why I welcomed the, the report that they published in May. However, um, I do believe that the provisions added at stage two are premature uh, and risk breaching the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, therefore, I welcome Graham Simpson's amendment proposing to remove this section from the bill. Uh, and while I recognise the intention uh, behind Alec Rowley's proposals, I cannot support them. Changes to compulsory purchase should be done through primary legislation, and it's unrealistic to reform such a complex area of law uh, in such a short timescale. Uh, the issue uh, does deserve uh, careful examination and consultation, including how proposals would interact uh, with other mechanisms such as planning agreements and the proposed infrastructure levy. Uh, we will therefore uh, work with the Land Commission, uh, the Scottish Futures Trust, local authorities and industry representatives to identify how local authorities can best use existing mechanisms to fund infrastructure and what support uh, they may need to do so. Uh, we will also look at how new mechanisms such as the levy and land pooling might complement existing mechanisms uh, and hence, uh, whether any changes are required to existing legislation and, crucially, how we can ensure that any changes are fully compliant with the ECHR. Um, I would refer members uh, to some of the issues around about this, uh, including the 1845 Land Clauses Consolidation Scotland Act, uh, which uh, is, I'm told, not going to be uh, particularly easy to unpick to make sure that we get uh, to EHCR uh, compliance. Uh, what I have said constantly, uh, and I will not uh, uh, move from this, is that if legislative change is needed, uh, then we will pursue that. That may take time, that may be in the next parliament, uh, but we will outline uh, how we intend to move forward um, uh, after this bill has passed, as has been said previously, uh, and we will, of course, um, try to work uh, with colleagues across the chamber, because I do think, like Mr Simpson, uh, that in the main there is cross-party support on these issues. Thank you very much. And I call on Graeme Simpson to wind up on this group and to press or withdraw. Amendment 112. Thank you. Um, I, I, would, I, I would urge the Minister, um, he, he really needs to make a, a statement on this uh, very soon after recess, um, you know, once, once we've passed this, passed this bill. Um, we need to get moving on this. The, there is cross-party support. There's, might look as though there's disagreement today. There isn't really. We all want to move on this. It's just a question of how we do it in legislation. Um, I don't think this is the appropriate place. This is a very complicated area. Uh, and my view is it actually needs, uh, it's a separate, an entirely separate piece of legislation to bring this forward. Um, so I will um, press the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. So the question is that Amendment 112 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. And so we'll move to division. This will be the first division of the day, however, so there'll be a five-minute suspension while I call all the members to the chamber, and then we will vote. A five-minute suspension.
Thank you, colleagues. We'll just pick up where we were, which is a vote on Amendment 112. So the question is that Amendment 112 be agreed to and members may cast their votes now. This will be a 30-second division. The result of the vote on Amendment 112 in the name of Graeme Simpson is yes, 88, no, 31. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. We're going to turn now to Group 17 Master Plan Consent Areas. Can I call Amendment 13 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with Amendments 125 and 126. Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 13 and to speak to the other amendments. Thank you very much, um, Presiding Officer. Um, master plan consent areas are one of the areas of the bill which I think has um, been broadly, broadly welcomed, although the exact um, impact, of course, will uh, remain to be uh, seen. I want to first address my own amendment uh, 13. Section 10, subsection 3 of the bill introduces a new Schedule 5A to the 97 Act, and part one of this schedule is concerned with general rules about the content of any master plan consent area. Section 3 of Part 1 lists those areas that may not be included in any such scheme, such as World Heritage Sites and Marine Protected Areas. Now, agreement to include such a list followed uh, Stage 1 scrutiny. And included in this list of those areas where one cannot have a master plan consent area uh, are national scenic areas, which is what my amendment uh, refers to removing uh, that. Now, I don't agree that national scenic areas should be excluded by law from schemes. Uh, and my Amendment 13 deletes NSAs from that uh, list. It's the only designation that I think should be excluded. Uh, I'm perfectly happy with all the rest. And I want to explain why, because national scenic areas cover large areas of Scotland, including settlements where there's a need for more affordable housing. Those areas include large parts of Western Ross, Assent, Sutherland, the whole of Harris, South Lewis, Kintail, Loch Shiel, and a quarter of the Cairngorms National Park. Now, as the Minister is aware, SNH has got a consultative role when a development of more than five houses is proposed in a national scenic area. But it does not have a consultative role when any such proposal is specifically provided for in the local development plan. The Minister will be probably aware of the recent controversy over affordable housing in North Sky. He'll also be aware that Circular 9, 1987 contains the relevant rules in that regard. And it's our view that master plan consent areas could play an important role in providing rural housing. And to exclude them by law from being available in national scenic areas is illogical when developments can already take place under existing planning provisions. Now, in many areas, master plan consent areas have the potential to provide a more effective means of providing rural housing. I've been told that by rural housing uh, providers. And so for those reasons, I'd urge members to support Amendment 13. Moving to the other amendments in the group, Amendments 125 and 126 reinsert notification, call-in and direction-making powers that were removed at Stage 2. Amendment 125 reinstates provisions that allow ministers to direct planning authorities to notify them, and those provisions were removed at stage two. Uh, Amendment 126 reinstates ministerial powers to call in uh, uh, proposals for master plan consent areas and to modify them. And again, my Amendment 95 at stage two removed those powers. So we'll be voting against Amendment 125 and 126. Now, I understand that ministers see these powers as a parallel to those in place for ordinary planning applications. However, given that we wish to see call-in powers curtailed, and in general, we wish to limit the power of ministers over planning authorities, we will be opposing those two uh, amendments. And I move Amendment 13. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister to speak to Amendment 125 and the other amendments. Uh, President Officer, Master Plan Consent Areas are a new way for planning authorities to take a proactive placemaking approach and provide consent. Uh, Mr Whiteman has argued they should be allowed in national scenic areas. And at stage two, uh, I outlined how we have worked with the relevant agencies and uh, agreed it would be right to restrict MCAs in international and national designations. I still believe that uh, that's a clear and appropriate approach. Uh, Mr Whiteman suggested MCAs could assist in uh, repopulating NSAs in the islands. However, the island authorities 
uh, have told us that they would not envisage bringing forward MCA schemes for land in such areas. Therefore, I do not support Amendment 13. Uh, my amendments 1 to 5 and 1 to 6 uh, seek to reinstate provisions removed at stage 2 uh, requiring planning authorities to notify ministers prior to finalising certain MCA schemes and to give ministers uh, associated call-in powers. Uh, these are important safeguards. Uh, members will have seen the key agencies groups letters uh, highlighting that there is a direct read across to the equivalent mechanism for notification and calling of applications and to leave it out for master plan consent areas would create a significant gap. Removing those provisions uh, removes the ability for ministers to consider calling in schemes where there are unresolved objections from national agencies. Uh, proposals that key agencies object to frequently also attract significant local interest with a public expectation that objections from a national agency will trigger a requirement for national level scrutiny. I hope that members will support amendments 125 and 126 to ensure that crucial layer of scrutiny for cases that raise issues of national significance. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. And can I ask Mr Whiteman if he wishes to add anything further to wind up? Uh, yes, I'm disappointed um, that the Minister, um, uh, in his response to uh, Amendment 13, I mean, I, I just don't understand how, if you can build up to five houses in some of the most uh, uh, pressured um, areas of, of Scotland, in Skye and tail in places, uh, because they're in the local development plan, why master plan consent areas shouldn't be available as well. And just because some local authorities have told the Minister that they envisage no role for them, is no reason to preclude any other local authority in any other part of Scotland, either today or in five or ten years, from a being able to avail themselves of these powers. So I'm, I'm disappointed, but I accept, I guess, how the vote will go. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now, and it is a one-minute division on Amendment 13. The result of the vote on amendment number 13 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes 33, no 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We turn now to group 18, technical regulations. Can I call amendment 124 in the name of the minister, grouped with the amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister to move amendment 124. Uh, President officer, this group of amendments is mainly technical, removing duplication and tidying up wording. Uh, there is just one with a little more substance, which is Amendment 155, Section 20B of the Bill inserts Section 77A into the 1997 Act. That enables ministers by regulations to make provision about the payment of compensation where planning permission granted by a development order is withdrawn and a subsequent application for equivalent consent is refused or granted subject to different conditions. Uh, in their stage two report on the bill, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee recommended that this power should be subject to the affirmative procedure because it deals with compensation and can apply or disapply provisions of primary legislation. I'm happy to accept that recommendation and put forward this amendment. For the rest, I can provide more details if members have any questions, but I hope that these technical changes uh, can be supported. Thank you, Minister. And no other member wishes to comment on this section. Therefore, they go straight to the vote, which is 
The question is that Amendment 124 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call amend Amendment 125, Minister, to move? Uh, move, President Officer. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 125 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division, and this will, in fact, be a, a one-minute division. Members, we cast the votes now. Amendment 125. The result of the vote on amendment number 125 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 94, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 126 in the name of the minister. Minister to move. Uh, moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 126 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. This will be a 30 second division on amendment 126. The result of the vote on amendment number 126 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 95, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call amendment 127 in the name of the minister? Minister to move. I move, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that amendment 127 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now on amendment 127. The result of the vote on amendment number 127 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 94, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. We're going to turn now to group 19, short term lets. Can I call amendment 156 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with the amendments as shown in the groupings? I would point out at this stage that if amendment 156 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 157, as it will be preempted, or sorry, and as a consequence, Amendments 157A to 157E, as they will all be preempted. Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 156. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Before I forget, I move Amendment 156. Uh, following concerns expressed to me by constituents shortly after being elected in 2016, I began looking into the question of short term lets, and I got the opportunity to lodge a general question on the 19th of January 2017, asking the Scottish Government what plans it had to regulate the growth. The Minister will remember that probably as the audible sex party question. Um, the Minister, Kevin Stewart, uh, told me that the Scottish Government has no plans to regulate the growth in short-term letting. He told me that any change of use was a matter for the Planning Authority and that I should engage in the consultation on the Planning Bill. So here we are, we're at stage three. I engaged in the Planning Bill. bill. I discussed the matter with planners, ran a consultation over summer 2018, and concluded that the planning rules governing change of use needed to be changed. 
Put simply, the conversion of a domestic dwelling to a commercial short-term let is a change of use and requires consent if the change is material. That's the law today. The problem lies in determining whether such a change is material or not, since planning authorities across the country tend to assess this question on the basis of the intensity and frequency of visitors. That is an impossible task for planning officers to effectively monitor the comings and goings uh, of visitors. So I lodged an amendment at stage two, which provided that a simple change of use from a dwelling to a commercial short-term let, which is no longer the sole or main residence of any person, constituted a change of use for the purposes of planning law with no additional material inquiries needing to be made. Now, this amendment was accepted at stage two. It formed section 11B of the bill. And at stage two, the minister promised to work with me in advance of stage two, uh, stage three, uh, as did Conservative members. And my amendment 156 reflects recommendations uh, from the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee to define short-term lets, which I have done. Amendment 156 does not, however, as been frequently claimed, fetter the discretion or autonomy of planning authorities in any way. It merely makes a modest change to the framework for considering change of use. Regulations that have been in place since 1997 and which are universal in their application across Scotland. So Amendment 156 makes a modest change to the gatekeeping functions, determining what is and what is not a change of use. Any change of use to a commercial short-term let is a material change of use today in almost every instance, and planning authorities are dealing with these applications today. Now, local flexibility, which has been at the centre of many people's concerns about this, does not arise from planning law. There's not a single piece of this planning bill of the 1970-97 Act, to my knowledge, that only applies in certain parts of Scotland. Scots law is for Scotland. Local flexibility does not arise from law, it arises from plans and policies that enable planning authorities uh, who are free to consent to as many or few applications as they wish in line with their own plans and policies. And my amendment does not change this one bit. Rachel Hamilton's Amendment 157 is a wrecking amendment. It sabotages the central purpose of Amendment 156 by making the modest change I've just outlined applicable only to short, so-called short-term let control areas, mm -hmm. a phrase I'm sure will be repeated ad nauseum by the SNP and the Tories to pretend that they've done something about this problem. Now, by making the provisions of 157 subject to further regulations, the opportunity is then created for the vested interests in the short-term let industry to influence those regulations in their own interest. And this should be no surprise to any member, since Airbnb was actually a member of the government panel on the collaborative economy. Now, we already know that some planning authority is not even interested in these so-called zones. Glasgow City Council argued last week and I quote, the zonal approach suggested by the Conservative Amendment did not fit with current policy. I quote, it would fail to protect the immunity of residents living outside of those zones who may be unaffected by, who may be affected by unauthorised change of use to short stay accommodation, said our council spokesperson. All of which raises the question, if planning authorities are not interested in the provisions within 157, these so-called uh, areas, when they're finalised, what are they to do? Well, what if they think that these control areas are of no use to them? I accept the parliamentary arithmetic. Rachel Hamilton's amendment will probably pass, but I put to the Conservatives a compromise some weeks ago. I said for those areas that are not to be short-term let control areas, allow them to enjoy some modest improvement in the law. Hence my amendments 157 A, B, C, D and E to Rachel Hamilton's amendment, which are designed to allow planning authorities for whom control areas are deemed not to be the answer, a more straightforward means of identifying properties that are changing their use. In other words, if the minister and Rachel Hamilton are genuinely interested in local choice, provide one. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Rachel Hamilton to speak to Amendment 157 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, there has been a growing concern about platforms such as Airbnb revolutionising the short-term renting of properties in popular tourist destinations. However, Scotland must be a welcoming country and we must have flexible and affordable accommodation right across Scotland. Particularly in the major cities of the world, uh, we have been experiencing this pressure. And the main focus, of course, here has been on Edinburgh. Yes, hang on, hang on one second, Ms Hamilton, just one, one second. Mr Findlay. Point, uh, uh, declared an interest at the start for contribution. So uh, <coughs> that's not a point of order, Mr. Findlay. It is up to each member to decide whether or not.
whether or not others would judge whether they have something to declare or not. That is entirely a matter for the member to decide. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like many other MSPs, I do not have a, an Airbnb or a short-term yeah. rental. Yeah. Apologise. But I thank, thank Neil Finlay for um, being so considerate. <laughs> of course, the main focus in Scotland has been uh, areas in Edinburgh, in particular the Old Town. And these areas have been weighed down by the burden of an increase in inward bound uh, visitors. The Scottish Conservatives are well aware of the concerns of local residents and understand that situations of antisocial behaviour and a lack of housing are just two areas of concern, which Andy Whiteman, in fact, talked to me about. Despite the lack of concrete data, we believe that there is anecdotal evidence to signify a regional variation, with Edinburgh, certainly as I've mentioned, experiencing the highest concentration yes, of short-term uh, lectures. Sorry, Ms Hamilton, would you, mind just yes. dropping, would you mind just pointing the microphone just slightly more towards you when you're speaking? It's not on. It's, it is on, but it's just... Uh, there we are. It's, it's red. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Sorry, I interrupted in the middle of a potential intervention, but it's back to Rachel Hamilton to decide whether to take an intervention or otherwise. I'll take an intervention. Is it Dugdale? I'm grateful to the member for giving way. I wonder if she'll just admit to the chamber that what she's doing with section 157 is providing a wrecking amendment to the work of Andy Whiteman. And if she's not wrecking the proposal that he's putting forward, can she explain why, as a Conservative, she's arguing for a more bureaucratic and time-worthy process? Rachel Hamilton. Well, of course, I completely disagree with um, Kezia Dug Dugdale. The amendment delivers a flexible approach, allowing local authorities to give discretion to set short-term let control areas. And I understand, and we understand well, the pressures that are experienced by residents. My amendment actually seeks to find a solution for local authorities to regulate in those areas that are saturated. And I would have thought that Kezia Douglas would have actually welcomed uh, this amendment. And I hope that actually Labour will eventually support it after they've heard what we have to say. I also would like at this point to um, thank uh, the, the government um, for working with Scottish government, uh, with Scottish Conservatives to achieve that aim. Freudian slip, sorry. Furthermore, our amendment will devolve discretion to local authorities to create short-term let control areas, as I, have, um, uh, as I have set out. The purpose of Amendment 157 is to target the requirement for planning permission to the most pressurous areas, where the local authorities can choose whether or not to promote short-term let control areas, within which planning permission will always be required. Can, can I just finish this section, please? Um, section 26B allows a planning authority uh, to designate all or part of the area as a short-term let control area, and in designated areas, the use of a dwelling house providing short-term lets would be a material change of use of the dwelling house and would require planning permission. And for clarification, a tenancy of a or a dwelling house or part of it, where all or part of the dwelling house is the only or principal home of the landlord or occupier, that does not constitute a short-term let. I'll give way to Andy Whiteman. I thank the member for giving Andy way. She, she said that the, um, within these control areas, uh, such a change of use will always require uh, planning consent. Is she not aware that that is actually the case right across Scotland today? And the only question is about the materiality of that change of use. And therefore, her amendment does nothing for the vast majority of Scotland who will probably never use these control areas because they're probably going to be far too bureaucratic and they'll be subject to the rules that the Scottish Government deem appropriate in defining what are short-term lets. Rachel Hamilton. Well, unlike Andy Whiteman, we're actually taking this uh, situation very ser seriously and putting residents first and also being a welcoming country and ensuring that we do create job opportunities and grow the economy. Moreover, my amendment seeks to deliver a flexible approach, which is the right one, allowing local authorities uh, saturated by short-term lets to regulate, but on the other hand, allowing for those authorities who do not have that burden not to be legally bound by regulation. My amendment clearly demonstrates a willingness to ensure a positive outcome for residents and communities, some of whom live in attractive and popular tourist hotspots. Andy Whiteman's amendments 157A to E will, if supported by the Scottish Parliament, create a situation where all short-term lets that do not fall under any exemptions in Section 11B will constitute a material change of use six months after the bill receives royal assent and so will require planning permission. Many owners and operators may find the use of property as a short-term let was unauthorised, putting them in breach of planning control, potentially exposing them to enforcement action. 
Should planning authorities be minded to take such action, of course, there will be a consequential burden placed on local authorities and uh, the owners and operators in obtaining retrospective planning consent. To sum up, it seems to me that Andy Whiteman's amendment has taken the kill approach, whereas mine is the cure approach. My amendment seeks to find a balance between happy tourists and happy residents, essentially driving tourism growth, but protecting residents with regulation. Andy Whiteman's amendment will kill off any future growth in tourism in areas that need it. My amendment provides a solution to local problems. I appeal to members to see sense and not to support Andy Whiteman's amendment. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Alec Rowley. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by thanking Andy Whiteman for the huge amount of work and effort he's been putting into this very important issue. So I think not only do we owe him thanks, but actually the whole uh, of the City of Edinburgh owes him thanks, because this is a city-wide problem in Edinburgh. Can I just make one observation? That small observations of, are often the signifier of much larger change. And if you look around the streets of Edinburgh on the main doors of tenements, you'll see key safes have appeared in doorway after doorway and that is a sign of a much larger change of thousands of residential properties taken out of residential use that has had a huge impact on the whole of the city but also particularly in my constituency and Rachel Hamilton says we don't have data well let me give her some data in my constituency alone 1810 addresses are registered with Airbnb out of a total number of 35,443 addresses in total in my constituency. That is 5% of all dwellings in my constituency. This is a huge impact to the city and why uh, citizens in Edinburgh are saying that we are increasingly experiencing a Disneylandification of this city. It is changing the nature and affordability of living in this city. So we have to acknowledge that Airbnb has changed from its original purpose. It's now a business a business that attracts investment and that has impacts on people and the city. And of course short term lets have their place, but not to the extent that it has had in Edinburgh. The reality is, is that we are seeing average house prices cruise towards £300,000 in the city. We have to regulate that, this. This is why Andy Whiteman's amendment is proportionate, will make a difference, and quite frankly, Rachel Hamilton's amendment is deficient because it is reactive, not proactive. It is simply shutting the stable door after the horse has bolted and gives no additional powers, no meaningful change to local authorities to regulate planning in this critical area. So I urge members to vote for Andy Whiteman's amendment because it's critical to ensure that we don't have this disproportionate change of use, taking houses out of residential use, putting them into uh, 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 business use. This city needs it and I urge people to vote with that in mind for the sake of, of Edinburgh and in particular members representing Edinburgh areas, this is an amendment that is required. Thank you. Can I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Kezia Dugdale? Yeah, thank you, President Officer. This is another group that illustrates the SNP Tory oh. stitch-up of this bill that has often suffered. They, they, may not, they, may not like, they may not like to hear it, but the new, the new SNP Tory alliance is is evident, evident in this bill. We would like to express our support for Andy Whiteman regarding these amendments. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance can shout all he likes, presiding officer. The fact is that we've seen once again a progressive proposal being, being halted by the alliance of the new alliance of the Tories and the SNP. That's the bottom line. We believe, we believe that the, the amendments are proportionate and are a proportionate response to the growth of short-term lets across Scotland, from urban centres to the highlands and islands. Unfortunately, they have been misrepresented as interventions that will prevent buildings from becoming short-term lets. In fact, they simply require a change of use with local authorities, the arbiter of the change. And Airbnbs that are no longer someone's sole residence do represent a change of use. They become a commercial entity and not a home. That is simply fact. 
Local authorities require a strong understanding. Yep. Michelle Ballantyne. Into this with interest, and I have some empathy with Andy Whiteman's position. But I want to ask this question because you're arguing that you need to protection, and, and I hear what Daniel said about it being in Edinburgh. But if you look at Rachel Hamilton's um, amendment at 1572, and she talks about the LEC control area, if you're right, then this is about localism, and a local authority can, if it chooses, designate the whole of its local authority as a LEC control area. So the same application would have, they'd still have to apply for permission. So it is giving localism for local authorities to decide, but the outcome would be the same in, in, in the case of having to apply for a change of use. So are you saying now that you don't support that localism? Alec Rowley. I'll come on to answer the specific point about Rachel Han Hamilton's amendment. But local authorities, and this is a fact, local authorities require a strong understanding of housing need in the local area. It is right that they should understand when a home undergoes a change of use and becomes a short-term let, particularly at a time when housing is in such short supply in many parts of our country. We are proud of Scotland's thriving tourism industry and we consider the room sharing and access to affordable accommodation that Airbnb has enabled as a positive contribution. But a high concentration of short-term lets in a small area can have a negative impact on shared spaces and community cohesion. Local authorities are understand the crucial role that tourism plays in local economies and we trust them that when they, for their policy on short-term lets and they form that policy, which must emphasise that it is separate to this amendment, they will reach a balanced position in the public interest. We do not support Rachel Hamilton's amendment in this group. The ineffective rent pressure zones are a case in point for why we should not trust ministers with these kinds of regulations. So I would urge the new SNP Tory Alliance to think again, vote in the interest of the people of Scotland and vote for Andy Whiteman's amendment. I call Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, President Officer, and I rise specifically to talk to uh, Section 156 and to oppose Section 157 and commend Andy Whiteman for his work in this regard. He's done it thoroughly over a number of months uh, and years, uh, doing the detailed work around the legislation, but also taking colleagues with him, providing opportunities for briefings, meeting with the industry every step of the way. He has done a very serious uh, and thorough job in that regard. Uh, Section 156, Amendment 156, uh, I think is particularly astute because it's not particularly radical. And I would urge members to look at the detail of this. Mm. It is not a crusade against the industry of Airbnb or other equivalent sites. What it does very specifically is to seek to curtail the proliferation of commercial lets. That's instances where we allow big companies or wealthy individuals to buy up properties all across the city for the sole purpose of putting them on the internet for short-term lets. These are not residential properties, they are businesses. Yes. This amendment makes no difference, difference, has no effect whatsoever on individual citizens who want to rent out their own property for a certain number of days or months in the year, or indeed a room within a house in which they live. That is not the effect of this amendment, it's simply to curtail the proliferation of commercial lets and I support it for three key reasons which I'll run through very quickly. Airbnb is causing misery to countless numbers of my constituents across the city particularly if you live down at the shore or in Leith Walk or off Easter Road represented by Ben McPherson, if you live in Portobello or Abbey Hill represented by Ash Denham, if you live in the Grass Market or the New Town represented by Ruth Davidson, all of whom will vote for uh, Rachel Hamilton's amendment this afternoon. This is antisocial behaviour on max. The second reason that I think it's important to look at these measures in detail is that they are distorting the property market. When big companies come in and buy up these properties it makes it harder for working people People to live in this city. If you go onto the internet today and look at how much it costs to rent a one bedroom property in the grass market on Easter Road, it is £850 for a one bedroom room in this city. That is pushing people out of the city and beyond its limits, all because of people buying up properties for the purposes of what you are voting on today. 
And finally, another reason to support it. Perhaps the whole point of Airbnb is to provide tourists coming to this city the experience of a home, what it's really like to live in the capital city of Edinburgh. All of that is lost when it's commercialised in the way that we're talking about today. So I say to Rachel Hamilton, actually far from killing off tourism, it's providing a sustainable alternative because it's protecting a means by which people can come and really experience what it's like to be in this city as a resident and as a citizen. I believe Amendment 157 is a wrecking amendment. It bulldozes right through the very purpose of Amendment 156 by introducing control areas. It kicks the can down the road into some grass called one day, maybe. And there's no scrutiny over it whatsoever about the size of the control areas, how they would operate, who would decide. It's far too late. SNP MSPs in this chamber should be uncomfortable in their seats today, voting with the Tories for this bill to go through. But there are some members who should be more uncomfortable than others. Those who represent areas where working people are being pushed out of them, where families are being priced out of their communities, where communities are being hollowed out by a largely unregulated industry. This is a small but important change. I commend Andy for the work that he's done and hope that constituents of those who vote for this amendment today hold their members to account at the next opportunity. Call Neil Findlay to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Neil Findlay. Yeah, thanks, President Officer. Andy Whiteman has uh, done exactly the right thing on this issue, and he has got support uh, from a, a great number of people across Scotland because he has worked diligi diligently on issues to address the very real concerns raised by constituents in areas where short term lets are impacting on the lives of people in the community. These are issues are very real in Edinburgh. I doubt if there's any uh, representative of this city who's sitting in this chamber at the moment who has not had representations on the impact of short-term lets. Because this is an issue not just in this city, it's an issue across the world. I was in Barcelona last year. There is a massive movement reacting against this in Barcelona. What we're seeing today is the government and the Tories coalescing to dismiss the concerns of people and communities whose lives are affected by this sector. Uh, no one is saying Airbnb and the like shouldn't exist, but we have to ensure that they are regulated and that local authorities who know the local housing market are that regulatory body. What we're seeing in this city just now is working class people being driven out of the city. They cannot afford to live in it. And representatives of this city need to look themselves in the mirror. I tell you, Having seen this firsthand, there is a growing social movement in the world, across the world, against this type of letting. And it will come here. It will grow here. This is just a marker for what is going to happen, because the more that people are driven from the communities that they should be living in, then there'll be a big reaction against it. And I'll tell you this, the Tories and the SNP should take note. Mike Rumbles. I too would like to thank Andy Whiteman for his efforts uh, with the subject. It's well recognised that Andy, has, Andy Whiteman has brought a, a, an area of knowledge to, to the Chamber which is to be welcomed. In my view, Rachel Hamilton's amendment is indeed a wrecking amendment. Unfortunately, it prioritises, it doesn't do more than that, but it, it prioritises the tourist industry against the rights and the individual residents. Rachel Hamilton wants to see short-term lets in pressured areas. What it doesn't do is affect the blight that some short-term lets, some short-term lets have made on individual residents not living in so-called pressured areas. If residents do not live in a pressured area, it can still cause immense problems for those individuals, and we've heard something about that already. Um, we're all being told that control areas are meant to cover pressured areas. That measure is being made clear in this debate, and I listened very carefully to what Rachel Hamilton had to say. And it is kicking the can down the road on this really important issue, and we should have addressed it a long time ago. And I, and I was very pleased that uh, Andy Whiteman has addressed it the way he has. It's so disappointing that the government, in coalition this time with the Conservatives, and I have to say I have a sense of deja vu, in the third parliament this always happened. Just for those members who weren't here in the third parliament, the SNP government and the Conservative Party always got together to push things through. So let's, well, I'm only stating, 
take the credit, take the credit where it's due. You managed to achieve that. And I'm, in a way, congratulating the Conservatives for the influence they had over, over the SNP administration. And I'm, I'm astonished I seem to be getting All this right, let's hear the member, please. Let's hear the member. I mean, I mean <laughs> uh, the, the smiles from the front bench uh, is amusing, I have to say. Uh, is, it is amusing. <laughs> but here we have... Uh, I mean, we used to accuse the UK government of kicking cans down the road on Brexit, but this is, a, this is kicking the can down. This, this is kicking the can down the road with government regulations yet again. I have, I have never thought it a good idea to leave regulations to ministers. It really is our role in this chamber, in Parliament, to put what we think is right on the face of the bill and not kick the can down the road, not leave it to government ministers to produce regulations which we cannot amend. Thank you, Mr. Rumbles. And I call the minister, Kevin Stewart. Um, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, I am, a, a, of course, very aware um, of the concerns that there are in certain parts of the country, uh, and particularly here in Edinburgh, uh, about the effects on local communities of houses and flats being used for short-term letting. Uh, and we need to consider how we can address these, these concerns whilst not undermining the economic benefits uh, of tourism, uh, particularly in uh, parts of the country uh, where they want to increase uh, holiday accommodation. Now, let me be clear about a number of points here. Um, first of all, uh, Mr. Whiteman in his speech said that what he was pr proposing uh, was a modest change. A modest change, says Mr. Whiteman. But his uh, amendment would require significant numbers of new applications, uh, costing up to £4.6 million pounds for applicants and up to £1.7 million pounds for planning authorities. And let me... No, I'll, I'll finish this part first, Mr. Whiteman. And, and let me be clear... It's for planning authorities uh, to determine what constitutes a material change of use of any property. It's Andy Whiteman's opinion, Mr. Whiteman's opinion, that a change from a sole or main residence to short-term letting should always be considered material. But that has not universally been the position taken in planning decisions and appeals. And a lot may depend on the location of the property uh, and the impact on amenity and on housing availability in the area, which is not the same in all parts of Scotland. And I'll take Mr Whiteman. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Minister for taking intervention. I mean, this has been one of the bits that's bedeviled this uh, conversation. I mean, the Minister put out a revised financial memorandum that talked of millions of pounds. And yet the only people who can determine whether a change is material are planning authorities and therefore planning applications are required in all instances now and even after this amendment and in his own consultation on short-term lets issued in April 2009 he says this he says there's no definition of what constitutes a material change of use from residential to short-term letting whether a material change of use has occurred and planning permission is therefore required is a matter of fact and agree for the relevant planning authority to consider on a case-by-case -case basis so all these applications should be coming into the planning authority anyway and my amendment makes no difference on the volume um, this is a, an argument that has been rehearsed in uh, my uh, office on a number of occasions. Uh, Mr Whiteman will not shift uh, in his opinion, and I talk about his opinion uh, on all of this. Let me, let, let me move on, uh, because separate, separately from the planning bill, the First Minister announced uh, a Scottish Government consultation on short-term lets on the 29th of April, uh, which will run... Uh, until the 19th of July this year. Uh, and this seeks the views on the regulation of short-term lets to enable councils to control the number of lets and ensure that they make a contribution to the services that they use, ensuring proportionate and appropriate, appropriate regulations and enforcement. Uh, and this is intended to help deliver uh, a programme for government commitment to give local authorities the powers that they need to balance the needs of their communities with the economic benefits of short-term lets. Now, we've heard a lot today um, from members from Edinburgh, and that doesn't surprise me 
um, in the least. And I think, you know, uh, that what is at right for Edinburgh is not a Scotland-wide difficulty. And that's why I support Rachel Hamilton's amendment. And that gives the flexibility uh, to local authorities in different areas. And it gives flexibility uh, to parts of, a of areas within those local authorities. Because what is right for Portree might not be right for Caithness, uh, as I have found out in the conversations uh, that I have had with members. What is right for Aberdeen City may not be right for parts of Aberdeenshire. And that is why we need the localism and the flexibility uh, with uh, the amendment that has been put forward uh, by Rachel Hamilton, which would allow planning authorities to consider uh, the impact of short-term letting in every part of their area and implement measures uh, where they are needed exercising their local knowledge and judgment to address short-term let letting proportionately. It is always so frustrating when members in this chamber uh, speak out in favour of localism, but when it comes to the crunch, are often willing to vote against localism. And that, I'm afraid, uh, does not wash with me. I don't support Andy Whiteman's Amendment 156 or Amendments 157A to E which would wrap around short-term let controls areas to perpetuate the situation where all short-term lets across Scotland would require permission for change of use. Amendment 219 would bring the provisions of Section 11B into effect in six months after royal assent, and this would leave very little time for landlords and planning authorities to prepare for the changes, whichever version of Section 11B is agreed. I therefore call on members uh, to reject the amendments in this group in the name of Mr Whiteman and to support amendments 157 and 159 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call on Andy Whiteman to wind up in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am beyond despair at this debate, really. I mean, I, we have um, properties in this city, in Aberdeen, in Portree. I know my mother lives in Portree. This is a problem in Portree. Uh, right across Scotland, which have not applied for planning consent and should be applying for planning consent. And nothing in my amendment changes the fact that they should be applying for planning consent. It merely makes it easier to identify the circumstances in which they should and prevent planning officers having to stand uh, at properties and gateways working out who's coming uh, and going. Now, I've had two unregulated flats in this city. One occupied by an 83-year-old woman. She's the last resident in her stair. She kept her front door open not the main door on the road. One day a naked woman runs in, followed by a naked man. They have sex in front of her in her living room, followed by another naked man who runs in shouting you're in the wrong flat. That's the kind of breakdown in social order that this is providing in places that people regard as home. Or a fifth year pupil, a fifth year pupil who needs her English to get into university doesn't get any sleep because in the flat above there's a bunch of probably rugby fans partying all night. She fails her exam, she doesn't get into university. And that's why I feel passionately, as do many other members, that this requires a more effective solution in the planning system in which this is already. It is already in the planning uh, system. Now, this debate has been de be beveled by misinformation. Rachel Hamilton talks about flexibility uh, and, and Michelle Ballantyne talks about localism. There's nowhere in the town and country planning use classes Scotland Order 1997, or the Planning Scotland Bill, or the 1997 Act, where any planning authority is allowed to opt out of planning law. The flexibility comes in plans and policies. So here's an enforcement action from Glasgow City Council, enforcing uh, an enforcement action in a flatted dwelling, saying it's contrary to policy CDP 10, meeting housing needs, and supplementary guidance SG 11, meeting housing needs, contained within the city development plan adopted on 29th March 2018. Glasgow have designated areas of the city. They can call them short-term control areas if they want, and have said there shall be no short-term lets in it. This is plans and policies that do this. So if Aberdeen or Portree or Paisley wants lots of them, they're free to do it. Nothing in my amendment uh, prevents that. Yes. Maureen Wood. For giving way 
Given that the Minister has a consultation in this very area, is it not advisable to wait for that, where we could, in fact, end up with a much better situation, like there is in Paris, where the uh, Airbnb is, has to be the main residence, it's only let for a third of the year, and has to be registered? Is there not a possibility we could get a much better system? Andy Wayman. I thank the member for that intervention. I'm not sure she's read the, 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 the consultation. The consultation is on a proposal to license the operators. It is not uh, a consultation on any changes to planning law. Just like the, license, the alcohol licensing, the first box you have to tick on an alcohol license, if you want to have a license, is have you got planning permission from the premises from which you intend to operate? So this will be solved by a more effective planning regime that determines whether those uses can take place and then by a licensing regime that makes sure the operator is a fit and proper person. And that's what that is, and I welcome that. So, um, presiding officer, this process has been disappointing, to put it mildly. Uh, promises to work together uh, have been uh, broken. Uh, I was told, in fact, that Rachel Hamilton's original amendment, number one, which was lodged back in December, uh, was not even endorsed by her party. Now, I first became aware of Amendment 157 when it was handed to me by a Conservative MSP minutes before I was due to have a meeting with representatives of the short-term let industry. And worse still, they'd been given a copy of it before I had. I was put in the rather strange position of knowing nothing about what was in an amendment and the short-term light industry who'd flew up from London knew all about it and thought it was a wonderful compromise. Now, it's no surprise that the Conservative Party's tourism spokesperson had nine meetings with the industry and has lodged one amendment to this bill. I had six such meetings during which I worked hard to find some changes that would address industry concern. We were actually working... Sorry, Mr Whiteman, Rachel Hamilton wishes to make a point of order. Rachel Hamilton. Signing officer, order. I seek guidance on this one. Uh, I uh, would like to state that I have not had nine meetings and um, I would like to see the evidence that Andy Whiteman has to suggest that I have had nine meetings with the short-term let sector. Thank you. I note that uh, the member wishes to um, correct the record. Uh, there are a number of uh, methods of doing so uh, which are open to, to both members. In this case, she has alerted the member to her own feelings about the matter, and it will be up to the member, Mr Whiteman himself, to decide whether to take action. Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank Rachel Hamilton for that uh, intervention. I have examined the Register of Interest, and I am happy to share with her the nine occasions on which she met with the industry. <laughs> She hasn't met nine times with Airbnb, but the wider uh, industry. Now, Airbnb, so I worked, I worked, I worked hard with industry. We were, we, were, we were even at the point, we were even at the point where we had drafting changes. And then Amendment 157 lands in front of us four weeks ago. Now, Airbnb, Home and Away, all the other industries have lobbied hard against regulation of this out-of-control industry all across the world. And they've got what they want. They've got an anodyne amendment that's worse than the status quo. Right. It requires further regulations by ministers, which will no doubt be the target of further industry lobbying to water them down. Now, I know from conversations I've had with planning officials and constituents in Lothian and throughout Scotland, in Portree, that this reform would be very welcome. 156 would be welcome. Unfortunately, it's been sabotaged by an amendment by Borders-based Tory MSP Rachel Hamilton, who, with the connivance of the SNP government, has lodged this amendment, restricting my modest reform to short-term let control areas, which, as I say, would be worse than the status quo. I'm happy to give way. Michelle Ballantyne. Yeah, I, ha I have to say, I, I stood up before and said, I have empathy with you. I've read everything you sent, and I did have a huge amount of empathy for this. And I did, on a personal level, debate between the two. But I think the way you're phrasing it now has just lost my empathy. Th this, is about, this is about trying. And I, I, would like you, I would like you, Mr Whiteman, to, to explain for me, for me, because you started this by saying this already existed, that everybody who had short-term let should have already been applying under planning law. Now, the authorities haven't, haven't enforced that, if that is what you believe. I, I personally, having looked at it, don't necessarily agree with you, but they haven't enforced it. You're now saying that they all want this and it would help them. But if you're arguing they already have it, why haven't they been using it? I am now thoroughly confused about what your position is. Mr Whiteman, Andy Whiteman. I thank Michelle Ballantyne. I think the Conservatives have been confused about this all the way along. Um, the, the, the Town and Country Planning Use Classes Scotland Order 1997 cites 11 classes of property, from businesses to residential institutions, assembly and leisure. 
uh, etc. Short-term lets are a sui generis use class. Uh, that means they exist outside those 11 uh, classes. That means that prima facie, they are a change of use, and only planning authorities can make a determination as to whether that change of use is material, and therefore a planning application is required in all instances. And one of the problems we have in this city, and I know in Portree as well, is that people are operating and changing use illegally. And that's why there's so many enforcement actions. That's why Glasgow's doing it. And Glasgow's doing it effectively because it's got good plans and policies. And all I'm arguing, as Kez Dardal said, is a moderate reform to remove this very difficult to apply materiality uh, test. Um, so I, I will sort of wind up there, presenting officer. I mean, I think the short-term light industry has run a sustained campaign of misinformation and downright lies about the impact of my amendment. It's frightened folk here in this city and across Scotland who are just letting out a room in their home into believing that I was intent on shutting down their enterprises. Yep. I know because they wrote to me with that concern. I was very pleased to correct the record and say this will have nothing whatsoever to do with you. So it's deeply disappointing I've been unable to secure improvements in the planning system for those affected by the blight of short-term lets. And while SNP and Tory MPs may be pleased with themselves this week, I'll continue to fight to defend the residents of Scotland in every way I can. Thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we move to the vote on Amendment 156, um, I would just point out that if Amendment 156 is agreed to, I will not be able to call Amendments 157 or any of the amendments to Amendment 157, that is 157A to E. So the question is that Amendment 156 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. We will move to a division. This will be a one-minute division on Amendment 156. The result of the vote on amendment number 156 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 35, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I would call amendment 157 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Rachel Hamilton to move. Moved. Thank you. I would call amendment 157A in the name of Andy Whiteman. Andy Whiteman to move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 157A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. This will be a 30-second sec division on 157A. The result of the vote on amendment number 157A in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 34, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 157B in the name of Andy Whiteman. Andy Whiteman to move. Not moved. Or not moved. The question, sorry, uh, I call amendment 15C in the name of Andy Whiteman. Not moved. Does Mr Whiteman wish to move either 157D or E? Oh, I'd love to, uh, presenting officer, but uh, I won't. <laughs> will not, unless any other member wishes to move him, we will not be moving 157 D or E. So the question is that Amendment 157 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote on Amendment 157 and again this will be a 30 second division.
The result of the vote on Amendment 157 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 87, no, 33. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now we're going to turn now to Group 20, which is the assessment of health effects. I would just point out to members at this stage that that was clearly quite a, a long uh, group. We are running slightly behind. Uh, I call Amendment 198 in the name of Monica Lennon, in a group of its own, Monica Lennon, to move and speak to Amendment 198. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to move and speak to Amendment 198 and refer to my register of interest as I am a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute. At stage two, I argued very strongly that planning has a unique role in protecting and improving public health. And I presented a, a number of ideas to maximise the potential of this planning bill to make a real difference. At stage two, I successfully amended the bill to allow an assessment of the likely health effects of national or major developments to be considered before planning permission is granted. Um, this is a, a requirement on Scottish ministers to make regulations and my amendment 198 is an add-on to strengthen this. 198 strength sets out what the regulations should take um, account of. Um, so I'll run through these as briefly as I can, but I just want to stress that this amendment is about making sure that public health is central uh, to the planning system. And it's about adding this requirement on major developments and uh, national developments. We're not talking about very small scale or household um, applications. So we're talking about things like um, the consideration of cycling and walking routes, access to green space and play and recreation facilities. And I'm moving this because the health of people in Scotland must be at the forefront when planning our communities. I think we would all agree that this has to include physical and mental health and doing this uh, in a way that we really try and tackle um, health inequalities. Um, so the assessment, what would it do? It would look at things like infrastructure provision, including housing quality. Um, I think all colleagues will know from their own casework that um, issues of, of poor quality housing, where we see people living in cold or hard to heat homes, homes that are damp, or, or cramped or have little outdoor space can have a negative impact on a person's health. Um, respiratory problems is something that, that comes up quite a lot. So this needs to be taken account in large scale developments. On transportation, the requirement would be to look at active travel, public transport provision and car dependency. Members will recognise the benefits of active travel, go far beyond just positive physical impact. Uh, walking and cycling is good for our mental health, it's better for the environment and reduces transport costs. Um, members might be wondering why we need to have Amendment 198. Um, I would say it's because we can't take for granted that these provisions are being properly addressed uh, under the current system. Um, last year, Scottish Housing News covered a report entitled Progress on Low-Car Neighbourhoods in Scotland, and it found that housing developers are locking people into unhealthy and expensive car dependency by failing to provide infrastructure or enable access to healthier travel options, including walking, cycling or car sharing. Um, this has been an issue that came up a lot in, in stage two, and I know it's important to members, access to healthcare. Uh, when I was working as a planner, when we talked about infrastructure, it was often about drainage and thinking about roads, not so much about healthcare. But I know from speaking to colleagues across the chamber that there's um, increasingly where new housing is being added on, people are finding that they can't get GP appointments and GPs are closing waiting lists. And that's why when we discussed it yesterday, that consultation with the, the NHS and the Chief Medical Officer is really important because we're not joining up the system. So the provision is about um, healthcare services, looking at um, the opportunities we need in communities. So when we talk about building um, units, as house builders do, or building houses, actually we need to build communities. So it's about how do we build in strong, resilient, cohesive communities um, where we can bring people together and create the opportunities for participation so that we don't see the rise in social isolation and loneliness that we are seeing. Um, another issue that, that came up in terms of healthcare um, at stage two, and I know some colleagues thought this is not really for the planning system to, to consider in great detail, but access to public toilets, and I know many members again raised that issue. So because of uh, 
poor and limited access to public toilets, with people in Scotland who have disabilities who are not able to get out and participate in our communities. And there's particular issues around uh, women and for older people. So again, we want all of that looked at. The regulation also looks at green space and children's play areas. Um, we know that green space um, has a positive impact on mental health and wellbeing, and children's play uh, is vital for their development and wellbeing. So really it's about putting these things into the, the heart of planning decision making. We must give people uh, the right opportunities to live a healthy lifestyle and that includes the choice to cycle, to walk, to access green space and play and be active in their community. Planning has the power to do that. Amendment 198 has the potential to positively contribute to public health and improve the health and well-being of all of our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lennon, I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I cannot support this amendment. Uh, this list of matters to be considered uh, is too prescriptive uh, and should not be set in stone uh, without further consideration uh, and consultation. Uh, and while each of the items in this list is clearly valuable uh, in the right circumstances, uh, the wording of the amendment means all of them must be considered in every health impact assessment um, the World Health Organization is clear that screening and scoping uh, should be used uh, to ensure that health impact assessments are appropriate to the development proposed. Uh, the public ref health reform agenda is considering place and public health reform and the place principle a key consideration for planning, which is about services and assets coming together to deliver better outcomes for people in an area. Uh, and we would expect this work to inform regulations about health impact assessments. Uh, it's therefore premature uh, to include a set of criteria uh, for the regulations at this stage, and I would ask members not to support this amendment. There's been some talk this afternoon uh, around about um, uh, amendments and uh, accepting uh, Tory amendments and others. Can I say that in these regards, apart from Rhoda Grant, all of the Labour amendments were lodged in the last two days available. Uh, having had seven months to discuss their ideas if they wanted, um, which they chose not to in many cases. And that shows the fact uh, of why we have not supported uh, some of these amendments, but we have supported many of Rhoda Grant's amendments uh, because uh, of the time available to communicate and to get things right. Now, you know, uh, it is not, it is not uh, my, I'm not able to force folk to come and engage. Uh, some folk have, um, and I think that the bill has benefited from that communication. Can I ask uh, Monica Lennon if she wishes to wind up or add anything else at this stage? Yes, I do. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, just to pick up on that final point, uh, Minister, I was very privileged to be part of the committee at stage two, and as someone who um, worked as a planner for 12 years across um, industry and in the public sector. I have to say I find it very disappointing that, that what the Minister was actually doing in terms of the, the meetings that he was having with selective MSPs was very much cherry picking and if I just know I want to I want to continue I'll, I'll let you back in I'll let you back in in a moment Minister if you want to sit down for a second I would like to continue because I see some people in the gallery who actually cared very deeply about, about these issues and myself, Andy Whiteman and others, including Graeme Simpson, worked very hard uh, and in good faith to, to find points of agreement. Now, we've obviously been betrayed by Graeme Simpson, as we've seen over the last two days, but when, when myself and other colleagues did have individual meetings, Minister, I didn't see you come to those meetings with an open mind, so I think you've been very selective. I'm sure Rhoda Grant's very grateful you've picked her out, but we're a team here, and we're very... <laughs> Order, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Stay classy, Minister. If we can Order, stick please. to the, the planning fine. bill, I'm sure you've got your own issues in your own group. But this planning bill actually matters. Order, please. Let's hear Miss Lennon. 
The planning bill actually matters to people in communities, and some of them are in, in the gallery. So I think the minister will reflect back on stage two, and he'll know fine well that he was being very selective of what he was willing to, to discuss, because he had a closed mind on equal rights of appeal, which we're going to get to. But if I can just pick up on 198, because that's what we're, we're talking about right now, I have to say, I think that was quite a pitiful response. It shows how timid this government is actually being. When it comes to the opportunity to actually transform the planning system. Because if we step back and look at the challenges that are facing the country, which are many, we know that, you know, we hear about record levels of investment in the NHS, record levels of workforce, but people's health isn't improving. It's the outcomes that actually matter. It's the outcomes that actually matter. I don't know where the Cabinet Secretary for Health is, but she'll know that Audit Scotland are saying that, that, yeah, Jean Freeman. So Ms Lennon is quite incorrect to say that people's health in Scotland is not improving and I'd advise her to look at the statistics and understand health in Scotland before she makes such random comments. Yeah. Monica Lennon. Well, presiding officer, I don't think it's random to care about the health inequalities that persist in Scotland. And despite successive despite successive health secretaries, we're not seeing real improvement. And in fact, we have the Auditor General warning that the future of the NHS is not sustainable. So let's join up and let's see what we can do through the planning system to actually help people to live longer and live well in their communities. Now, we have very well um, established uh, frameworks around environmental impact assessment minister. So if we can do that kind of assessment, I'm sure the health, the education secretary knows much more about it, but if the minister does care to listen for a moment, if we can do environmental impact assessment, why can't we do health impact assessment to the same standard? So the minister's talking about being overly prescriptive. We can't leave these matters to chance. So I am very disappointed that the minister is not willing to uh, accept or support 198, which is simply an add-on to what's in the bill, which would make clearer what we expect across all of our planning authorities. Communities want that kind of transparency. How else is the Minister going to satisfy colleagues uh, like Alex Cole Hamilton and, and like Ian Gray, who know of examples in their communities where people can't get a doctor's appointment, they've got the keys to a shiny new house, but they can't get to see a doctor. I'd be happy to give way, the minister's shaking his head. That's the reality. These are the practical solutions that we need. I'm, I'm willing to give way to, to the minister. Ms Lennon, I think it's time to conclude the remarks and okay. to press a withdrawal. I can conclude on that point, thank you. Oh. Oh. Hey, Ms Lennon has spoken eloquently. Um, I, eloquently, I say that in inverted commas, about the health, uh, health uh, effects related to housing development. But not all national and major developments are housing. Um, how uh, would all of this fit uh, and be relevant to other infrastructure, uh, such as flood prevention or renewable energy? This is the point that I would make again. Ms Lennon chose not to engage. If she had engaged, we might have come up with something that was workable. Unfortunately, she chose once again not to engage. Monica Lennon. I don't remember receiving an invite, but what I would say... What, what, I, what I, OK. OK. Well, we're not here to discuss diary issues, but what I would say is that I know... I have worked with and I still know... Ms Lennon, I think okay. at this stage we've had a, a full debate on uh, Amendment 198. Yeah. I would conclude your remarks no. and move to a vote if on I can conclude by saying I know many planners who work across Scotland and they are more than capable, if they get this right guidance, of making sure they can hold developers to account so that they can ask developers to provide this information. Maybe the Minister should have more faith in Scotland's planners. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, oh, one second, one second, members. <laughs> members, I'm conscious, of the, I'm conscious of the time, and I'm afraid we're running rather uh, behind uh, schedule. So, before we move to the vote, uh, under Rule 9.8.5a, I'm minded to accept a motion, address this to the Minister for, for Parliament. 
I'm minded to accept a motion without notice to propose that the time limit be extended by up to up to 30 minutes. <laughs> I call Graham Day. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, at the risk of incurring the wrath of colleagues for the second time in 24 hours, I so move. Thank you very much, Minister. This is at my request. The Minister is moving this motion. Uh, the question is that the time limit be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? <laughs> if we're not agreed, we'll have to move to a vote. We will have a vote on the motion. OK, I will... Okay. I'll put the question, I'll, I will put the question again and I will make sure there are extra uh, resources put outside uh, condiments for Mr Lyle to get his blood sugars up. Uh, the question is that the, the Parliament agrees that the uh, time limit would be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move now to the question on Amendment 198. The question is that Amendment 198 198 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. So we'll move to a vote. This will be a one minute division on Amendment 198. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 198 in the name of Monica Lennon is yes, 32, no, 90. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 128 in the name of the minister, already debated, minister to move. <coughs> minister to move amendment 128. Oh, moved, presiding officer, sorry. Thank you. The question is that amendment 128 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We're going to turn now to Group 21, which is Renewable Energy Infrastructure. And can I call Amendment 199 in the name of Claudia Beamish, grouped with the Amendments 203, 220 and 221. Claudia Beamish to move the Amendment 199 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I move Amendment 199. Uh, the aim of this amendment is that renewable energy infrastructure be required to be included in commercial and domestic new builds over a certain scale, as highlighted in the amendment. Um, after a certain date. I've used the Town and Country Planning Act 2009 uh, definition for major developments referring to housing and business and general industry specifically. This amendment builds on the one I was delighted to have passed at stage two, which obliges, obliges local authorities to consider renewable energy in the formulation of local development plans. I'm clear that in this climate emergency, it is imperative that the Scottish Government sets clear guidelines as to what is acceptable in terms of how our dwellings and our commercial properties are both heated and lit. However, I have not gone so far as to bring forward an amendment to say that every newly built house and commercial building must only have renewable energy installed. Tempting as this was, this would be the obvious and logical next step, and nothing in this amendment prevents this happening, I hope, in the near future. In relation to these larger developments, Scottish ministers will, by regulation, require an application for planning permission for a major development to include renewable energy infrastructure, and the regulation on the aims of this amendment must be drafted and laid before the Parliament two years after royal assent. This would enable the construction industry time to plan for this deadline and send a clear signal to manufacturers about where they should be going in the climate emergency. This shift can be part of the just transition with appropriate strategic planning and relevant training strategies developed. 
There is also a consequential amendment to make the regulation subject to affirmative procedure. This amendment is supported by Scottish Renewables, who agree this would give important support to small-scale renewable energy projects such as solar PV and hydro, as well as for, the, for Scotland's renewable heat industry. I now move to Amendment 203 um, on small-scale renewables. And this amendment removes the planning permission requirement for small-scale renewables. Certain small-scale renewable developments will automatically be permitted development and therefore not need planning permission. For the purposes of subsection 2A, small-scale renewables means renewable sources of energy including anaerobic digestion and biomass, solar, wind or water with a total power output of 20 megawatts or less. And I stress it says includes. The crucial element is that this is an accurate description of what constitutes small-scale renewables from the Renewables Obligation Scotland Order 2009. Ministers are to set appropriate exemptions through regulation. This might be for a listed building or a property in a conservation area, for example. The, permitted, the permitted development system is under the development orders that ministers can make under Section 30 of the 1997 Act. In terms of precedent, there are some amendments at Stage 2 that sought to piggyback on that system as a way of saying planning permission should be granted automatically or could not be classed as permitted development in certain circumstances. An example is John Finney's um, amendment at Stage 2, 164, on gypsy traveller sites. I've included the regulation-making powers for Scottish minister to, ministers to adjust exemptions and circumstances as they see fit, and the whole amendment is subject to the affirmative procedure through consequential amendment 221. This amendment is also supported by Scottish Renewables. They note the small-scale renewables sector urgently needs attention in response to the closure of the feed-in tariff and the limited utility of the Smart Export Guarantee. I hope this is an area the Scottish Government will lend a hand in. In this climate emergency, I hope all members will accept the necessity of supporting this straightforward amendment, which will enable a speedy and reasonable and proportionate way to enable residents to transfer to ways of heating and lighting their homes and contributing to the transformational change we all need to act on as we shift to net zero emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government is... Uh, fully committed to ensuring the planning system contributes to achieving a net zero uh, economy. And while I commend the intentions behind Amendments 199 and 221 on renewable energy infrastructure, I can't support the introduction of provisions uh, which could add complexity and regulatory burden and which cut across the proper consultation uh, and public engagement which is already underway. Uh, this includes uh, a review of the energy standards of the Scottish building regulations, uh, and we are considering next steps to further enhance the energy performance of buildings. This will include investigation of the continuing role of renewable technology, technologies in the delivery of new buildings with very low energy demand and emission. It would be inappropriate to preempt the outcomes of that review with primary legislation could that could then not be changed um, without a further bill. Amendments 203 and 220 seek to impose a requirement on ministers to introduce permitted development rights for renewable energy infrastructure for both domestic and non-domestic properties. However, permitted development rights are already in place uh, for the majority of technologies listed, uh, and we have previously consulted on others. Further, the amendments seek to introduce permitted development rights for development that could fall within the category of major developments, for example, a 20 megawatt wind farm. Such permitted development rights would remove public consultation, including pre-application consultation, if they were to be progressed. Uh, we have already committed to consulting on a work programme for expanding permitted development rights following this bill, alongside a sustainability appraisal which has been progressed with input from a wide range of stakeholders, and we should not preempt the outcome of that consultation. 
Finally, through Energy Efficient Scotland, uh, we are putting in place a regulatory framework to make it the norm to invest in improving energy efficiency and reducing emissions from existing buildings. We are also taking steps to strengthen our policy framework uh, for low carbon heat and will publish a heat decarbonisation policy statement and action plan in summer 2020. In short, these amendments cut across a wide range of work that is already underway to support renewable energy infrastructure. Uh, and I would ask Ms Beamish not to press them, uh, but she can ass uh, be assured uh, that I will continue to engage with her on these issues uh, as I have done in the past. Thank you. And I call on Claudia Beamish to wind up in this group. Uh, thank you, presiding Officer. Um, I find it somewhat perplexing that the Minister says in relation to my amendment on small-scale renewables that it would make for more complexity, if I understand him to be saying it correctly, in that what I'm attempting to do is to make things much simpler for many constituents, particularly who I know of in my region, who um, are, say, off-grid, who've wanted to actually move to um, low-carbon sources of heat and of, um, of light and um, have had to go through quite onerous processes. So I, I don't really uh, understand this part of what the minister is saying. So I'm hoping for an intervention. Uh, I, 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 again, presiding officer, if there had been earlier discussion around about some of this, uh, we could have got this absolutely right. What Ms Beamish has in terms of her amendments here actually would make things much more complex in some cases at points where we want to get rid of that complexity. Um, and, you know, again, I would say this is one of the reasons why it is always good to talk in these issues at early stages so that we can help to get this right. Claudia Beamish to uh, conclude and to press or withdraw Amendment 199. Right. I, um, I, I'm not going to press this amendment because I don't think it's something that um, actually should be voted down. I'm disappointed with what the Minister is saying, but I don't intend to press it because um, I, I would be prepared to and have worked on other issues in, um, uh, in the lead-up to this, to, to this bill and others with the Minister and with other Ministers. Um, and frankly, the reason that I put this in at a late stage was... Uh, because I, late ish stage was because I actually thought it was quite straightforward. But um, I'm, I'm not prepared to have it voted down, and I will um, have dialogue with the Minister about uh, the future. And he's highlighted one more point that he did highlight, which I was keenly aware of, which made me hesitate as to whether to put um, the, the larger um, infrastructure um, amendment that I've argued for in was in relation to building regs. So I am aware that there are. Um, issues within building regs which are going to be consulted on. So that gives me some cause for optimism. Okay. Thank you, Ms Beamish. Does any member object if Ms Beamish withdraws Amendment 199? No. That's all right. That is withdrawn. Um, can I call Amendment 176 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, which was already debated yesterday? Lewis MacDonald to move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 176 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. We're going to move to a division on this. This is a first division after a debate, so it will be a one-minute division on Amendment 176. Members may cast their votes now. This is Amendment 176, a one-minute division. The result of the vote on amendment number 176 in the name of Lewis MacDonald is yes, 33, no, 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 177 in the name of Lewis MacDonald? Lewis MacDonald to move. 
That is moved. The question is that Amendment 177 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. This will be a 30-second division on Amendment 177. Members, be cast the votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 177 in the name of Lewis MacDonald is yes, 32, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 178 in the name of Lewis MacDonald? Lewis MacDonald to move? Not moved. And it's not moved. Can I call Amendment 179 in the name? 179 in the name of Lewis MacDonald. Lewis moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 179 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We will move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now on Amendment The result of the vote on Amendment Number 179 in the name of Lewis MacDonald is yes, 32, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 129 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Be presiding officer. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. This is a 30 second division on Amendment 129. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 129 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 87, no, 32. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I'm going to turn now to Group 22. There will be a short break after this group, by the way. Group 22, Determination of Applications, Brownfield Land. I call Amendment 130 in the name of the Minister. Minister to speak and move uh, Amendment 130. Uh, President Officer, Amendment uh, 130 uh, removes an amendment that was brought forward at Stage 2 by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Uh, I spoke against it then, uh, and I believe others now agree that it goes too far. Uh, I fully recognise the importance of the Green Belt, our policy for this is set out uh, in the Scottish planning policy and planning authorities have a key role in applying this locally. Uh, we would naturally expect that anyone who wants to develop in the Green Belt would set out how their proposals fit with national and local policies and the planning authority would take that into account in making their decision. However, there are many problems with Mr Cole Hamilton's approach. Uh, it is very restrictive definitions are unclear and it could effectively ban all development in the Green Belt. The Green Belt is important uh, but it is not a blanket restriction on development. I'll give Alex way to Cole Mr Hamilton. Cole Hamilton. I, I look forward to hearing the Minister's remarks to expand on that ludicrous claim that this would lead to a complete ban of any development on the Green Belt. My amendment, as accepted at stage two, merely forces conversations to be had about the prioritisation of land use in any local authority area. Minister. Uh, that is not uh, what Mr Cole Hamilton's uh, amendment said. Um, the Green Belt is important. Uh, but it is not a blanket restriction uh, in development. Uh, what would happen, for example, if someone who lives in the Green Belt wants to extend their home in a modest way, for example? Uh, should there be a ban on sensitively designed car parks that allow people to access the countryside around our cities? 
Perhaps most worryingly, worryingly uh, this could lead to councils reducing their green belts and creating new, more flexible designations to allow for appropriate and necessary development. I fully expect that as we take forward our review uh, of the national planning framework, we will have a proper debate on the future role of green belts in Scotland and that we will also look closely at the issues of green field uh, versus uh, brownfield development. In the meantime, to avoid imposing an overly restrictive and unworkable set of requirements on authorities, residents and businesses, I call on members to support Amendment 130 and remove Section 14D from the Bill. I move Amendment 130. Thank you, Minister. I call uh, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The, um, the Minister has admonished several members in this debate thus far for not coming to the table to discuss the workability of amendments before this Parliament. Um, he says my approach in 14D goes too far, yet he has made no overtures to me to talk about making this workable or to finding an amendment that would deliver on what I sought to do at stage two. Also, I, I, I want to take my opportunity to address a number of the points the Minister made in his remarks in, in support of Amendment 130. He said that it would, how, how it would be impossible for somebody who lived on Greenbelt to apply an extension. My amendment says that the developer has to demonstrate why it would not be possible to, to make that development on existing brownfield land. Well, if you are a homeowner looking to make an extension and you do not own the brownfield land that may be available several miles from your house and it is impossible to make your extension on that brownfield land several miles from your house. But, presiding officer, we created the concept of greenbelt and brownfield for a reason. Now this uh, section I brought in was uh, in response to a problem that is particular to Edinburgh but that is not unique to Edinburgh. My constituency of Edinburgh Western has over the last decade uh, experienced a proliferation, a rampant proliferation of housing development. Some of it on greenfield, some of it on much loved natural heritage. Now Liberal Democrats are not instinctively or ideologically opposed to housing. We recognise that Edinburgh needs new housing. We support the growth of Edinburgh's housing, but in the right spaces, in the right spaces and on an intelligent basis. Now, two weeks ago, just two weeks ago, the SNP-led administration on Edinburgh City Council, along with other members of other parties, green-lighted a much unwanted development on the Camo estate. Now, that will see a loss of much-loved areas of natural heritage. Not green belt, I should add, but only because the SNP-led administration changed its designation in 2016. The Garden District at Guile will see, which was again green-lighted by Edinburgh City Council, will see the proliferation of 2,000 homes on areas already designated as green belt. The point is, presiding officer, we need to engender discussions around this. We can't just have a lip service commitment to the idea of Greenbelt or Brownfield if there is no legislative imperative for councils to receive representations from developers as to why there was no other way of building on Brownfield site. There are many areas of deindustrialized area, areas in Edinburgh crying out for regeneration, for the development of the much needed houses for mid-market rent and social housing, which frankly, developers are cynically not looking to because they know they can build mansions in greenfield land in my constituency instead. So I would ask the members to reject this amendment. It, this, this is important for instilling a conversation at a planning level about the use of greenfield. It does not lead to a ban of any development whatsoever on greenfield land. And I ask the parliament to reject the minister's amendment. Thank you, Nicole. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, I, I supported Alex Cole Hamilton at stage two, but I think this is uh, an example of where this is an example of where we actually need to look at what we have passed, and it comes down to the words that are in the bill at the moment. So let me read them out. Without prejudice to the generality of subsection one, where an application is made to a planning authority for planning permission for development on land designated as Greenbelt land, a planning authority may not grant planning permission if the applicant has not included in the application 
a statement setting out why the development cannot be achieved on land the planning authority consider brownfield land. So let's think about that extension. How are you, how are you going to manage that? And then the brownfield land that was considered and why it was not considered suitable. So you have to, you have to show that you considered a piece of brownfield land. So how, I mean, how, is, how on earth is that achievable for a, a small scale extension or a conservatory or something like that? Yes. Alice Colhampton. I'm very grateful. Again, this point was made by the Minister, that anyone living in green, green belt land who had a house, an existing house, who wanted to build an extension, would have to uh, give a representation to the council as to why it was impossible for them to build on brownfield land. Well, the argument that they would make quite reasonably to the local authority is that that brownfield land is not attached to my house. <laughs> Graeme Simpson. Well, I mean, I, I simply read uh, what was passed at stage two, the brownfield land that was considered. So you have, you have to have considered a piece of brownfield land if you want to extend your house. Now, I'm not against the, the principle of what Alex Cole Hamilton was trying to achieve, but I think here is another example of where, you know, members, members just have to accept that maybe they didn't get things quite right at stage two. I've done it. Um, and, and, and I know that people have been trying to contact Alex Cole Hamilton to discuss this. Um, he, could have, he could have requested a meeting with the minister. It appears he didn't do that. Um, and that's to be regretted because we could have, we could have seen improvements rather than vote this down. And I call on the minister to no other member to speak. I call on the minister to conclude. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Um, we have to work with what we've got. Um, and section section 14D uh, requires that planning authorities could not approve any application for development likely to have an adverse effect on any intrinsic natural or cultural heritage value of the proposed greenbelt land. That's a very high bar and does not allow authorities to consider the benefits of the proposals. For example, uh, facilitating access to the countryside. Section 14D would also conflict with Section 25 of the 1997 Act, which sets out that decisions should be made in accordance with the plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Planning authorities must have the discretion to appropriately weigh up relevant issues in making decisions. And beyond that, definitions as are, are unclear in section 14D. There is no statutory definition of brownfield land and local authorities are not required to designate it. So it's not clear how an applicant could know what land is considered to be brownfield by the planning authority. There's also a difference between designated greenbelt land and greenfield land. There can be brownfield land and a greenbelt, for example, old quarries or derelict farms, which could very well benefit from redevelopment. As it stands, 14D is a guddle. Please back the amendment to remove it. Thank you. Um, apologies, Mr. Rumbles. I think this light went on just as I called the minister. I've called every other member who wishes to contribute, uh, and I'll just sum up shortly about where we've reached. But before we do that, the question is that Amendment 130 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. This will be a one-minute division on Amendment 130.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 130 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 88, no, 32. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now, at this stage, I just put out we are at um, we're five and a half hours into this debate altogether. Members may have noted we've actually passed the agreed time limit, the extended agreed time limit, by another five minutes uh, to allow this. Uh, so I exercise my power under Rule 9.8.4a to allow the debate on that particular group to continue. Um, However, um, just members know we're, we're roughly then 35 minutes behind schedule. We may catch up some of that time. Uh, I'm still going to take a short break, uh, up to 10 minutes, but if members coming back before that, we will start sooner. So a short break, short suspension of up to 10 minutes.
Okay, colleagues? Thank you very much, colleagues. I think um, the main participants in the next group are here, so we will resume. Group 23, Assessment of Environmental Effects. Can I call Amendment 200 in the name of Claudia Beamish, grouped with Amendments 181 and 219. Claudia Beamish to move Amendment 200 and to speak to all the amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move Amendment 200 in my name. Um, these amendments uh, aim to bring climate change considerations more firmly into the process of determining an application for planning permission for a national development. Amendment 200 states that before planning permission is determined, a planning authority must consider the development's life cycle greenhouse gas emissions and the impact this will have on our emissions reduction targets. Amendment 219, I have mentioned before in relation to earlier amendment uh, to the National Planning Framework part of the bill, as it is consequential to both. Defining life cycle emissions as the development's construction, operation and decommissioning. And this rounded approach is correct in my view. I had a similar amendment at stage two of this bill and I've made adaptions following the Minister's comments uh, before removing major developments from this requirement would be um, an improvement and save duplication. Members will also recall I had a similar amendment in the National Planning Framework section of the bill and this amendment 200 can work alongside that one. The duty in this amendment is placed on the planning authority. Again, I highlight the context of the climate change bill in the process of agreeing a target of net zero emissions by 2045, and this government and other parties having declared a state of climate emergency in Scotland. In light of this, we must see national development uh, proposals being explicitly considered in this framework and weigh up the long-term cost implications and climate change impacts of development proposals against potentially competing considerations, which may well be uh, more short-term economic considerations. This can lead to an approach more aligned to sustainable development and help guide us to make decisions which avoid investment that will not serve us well in the future and could indeed well lock Scotland in to unsustainable developments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Beamish, I call Graeme Simpson to speak to Amendment 181 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you. Um, at stage two, I attempted to get a very similar amendment through, um, but it was voted down uh, by mistake um, when Monica Lennon voted the wrong way um, <laughs> when she didn't intend to. It was, it was an error, um, and she uh, uh, admitted to that later. So that was unfortunate. However, um, if that had gone through and it had been in the bill, I would have been changing it because like the uh, previous section that we debated, it did go too far. So I've brought this back uh, in a different form. It establishes the principle that development needs to result in positive outcomes for biodiversity. Um, it should provide some assurance to communities that decisions to approve development will be positive for nature, um, will not be supporting Claudia Beamish's Amendment 200. Environmental impact provisions appear elsewhere in the bill, such as my Amendment 181, if that gets through. We will be supporting Claudia Beamish's Amendment 219, which defines life cycle greenhouse gas emissions as the emissions associated with the construction, operation, and decommission of a development. And there's an example of a brief speech, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Can I call the minister? Uh, presiding officer, I've already supported Claudia Beamish's amendment uh, that would require assessment of the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions for national developments as part of the preparation of the national planning framework. I believe that it is the right time to undertake that assessment to introduce the same requirements for individual planning applications for the same developments, risks, duplication, uncertainty and delay. And for that reason, I do not support amendments 200 and 219. Uh, I can, however, support Graham Simpson's Amendment 181. I've already brought forward Amendment 173 
To provide that securing positive effects for biodiversity will be a key outcome for the national planning framework. In addition, our strong track record in environmental assessment in Scotland means that consideration is already given to biodiversity where appropriate in determining individual, determining individual planning applications. So I'm happy to include this additional wording. Thank you very much. And could I call on Claudia Beamish to wind up in this group and to press a withdrawal amendment 200? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I will indeed press this amendment. I find it disappointing um, that the Minister is not prepared to accept um, 200, seeing as it seems that there is a logical progression that if the national planning framework is identifying the concerns in relation to um, the life cycle of these developments, that it is only appropriate that they are assessed um, in, in terms of an individual planning application as well. And I think this would put an onus on local authorities to carefully consider um, where they are going with, um, with, with these issues. Uh, so I do intend to press this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. And the question is, therefore, that Amendment 200 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. This will be a one-minute vote, and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 200 in the name of Claudia Beamish is yes, 32, no, 84. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 180 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, debated yesterday? Moved. Moved by Mr MacDonald. The question is that amendment 180 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. This will be a 30-second division. The result of the vote on amendment number 180 in the name of Lewis MacDonald is yes, 32, no, 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 131 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Move, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that amendment 131 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 131 in the name of the Minister is yes, 87, no, 31. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. 
I turn now to Group 24 on access panels, and can I call Amendment 168 in the name of Jeremy Balfour in a group in its own, and Jeremy Balfour to move and speak to Amendment 168. Uh, thank you, um, President Officer. I move this amendment in regard to pre-application consultation process for major developments. Um, as I'm sure many members are aware, the pre-application consultation often is the a starting point, but a very important starting point in making sure that what is then delivered, perhaps months or years later, is suitable and correct. My amendment um, calls upon access panels uh, where they are um, available within a local authority to be consulted on and at this stage. Um, I think this is in particularly important in regard to major developments because too often uh, disability issues are not looked at and not identified in an appropriate way. Uh, often planners and developers will talk about wheelchair access, but as all of us are aware, uh, disability is much greater and wider than that, and often these issues are not addressed. Uh, I think this amendment would be something that would help uh, developers and those who have disabilities to engage properly in the process, um, and thus I uh, look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say about it. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government absolutely supports the principle of disabled people being involved in shaping the places where they stay. And I've introduced an amendment to require planning authorities to engage early on the development plan uh, with disabled people. However, I can't support this amendment as it stands for a number of reasons. Uh, as I noted at stage two, access panels are not statutory bodies and not all authorities have access panels that cover the whole of their area. Uh, Mr Balfour's amendment would require consultation after the application for a major development had been received by the planning authority when it is difficult to make any significant changes. And applications for major developments include engineering works and energy projects where access panels may feel they have little to add. I consider that engaging disabled people at the pre-application stage on the right kind of developments will provide a better opportunity for issues around access to be considered before finalised proposals are brought forward. Uh, we'll be bringing forward proposals for changes to development management procedures, including pre-application consultation following the completion of the scrutiny of the bill. I'm happy to commit that engaging with disabled people will be part of those proposals and the Scottish Government will certainly highlight the role of access panels where they exist in that process. I would ask Mr Balfour not to press his amendment. Jeremy Balfour to wind up on this group and to press or withdraw Amendment 168. Uh, thank you again, President. Can I thank the Minister for his helpful remarks um, and intervention and in light of those, I will not be pushing the amendment in regard to that. Thank you very much. Does any member object if Jeremy Balfour withdraws Amendment 168? No. no one does. That's great. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 181 in the name of Graeme Simpson, already debated with Amendment 200. Graeme Simpson to move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 181 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 182 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, debated yesterday with Amendment 175. Lewis MacDonald moved. moved. Thank you. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 182 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 25, Conditional Grant of Planning Permission. Can I call Amendment 132 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, and the Minister to speak, sorry, to move Amendment 132 and to speak to the other amendments? Uh, President Officer, my amendments in this group are just minor changes to tidy up the wording of the provisions relating to changing places' toilets. Uh, we have also taken the opportunity to ensure that these essential facilities are accessible and publicly available. Um, and I'd like to thank members, including uh, Jeremy Balfour, Mary Fee um, and uh, Angus MacDonald for their input in all of this. It's been very welcome. Uh, the other amendments in this group have laudable aims, but they do not work in practical terms. Um, I do wish that Mr Cole Hamilton uh, and Ms Beamish should engage with me and officials on these amendments, as Jeremy Balfour and other members have done. And at an earlier stage, we might have been able to agree on something that actually worked. Taking Mr Cole Hamilton's amendment first uh, would be simply daft to set standards for digital technology and primary legislation, uh, because that technology changes 
very, very quickly indeed. Fibre to the Cabinet, as mentioned in the amendment, is not even the gold standard today. Openreach routinely offers fibre to the premises for any development of 30 or more houses, and that would not comply with this proposed requirement. I will give way. Ask Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. I, I accept that he may be speaking to my previous amendment, but I noticed there was an error to the original amendment uh, on reviewing it for our whip sheet just this week. And uh, you'll see that I have submitted a correction, which explains that this will take fibre to the premises if my amendment is adopted. Minister. Uh, President officer, the government is committed to ensuring that each and every premises in Scotland has access to superfast broadband through partnership between local authorities, developers and telecoms operators. Uh, we have provision in planning policy and in building standards to support this, but operators have, uh, have to plan their work in different areas and imposing broadband requirements on planning permission could prevent the delivery of housing if the timetables do not line up. And as I said, um, you know, I think it is very unwise uh, to put this uh, into primary legislation uh, when things change on a regular basis. I'll give way to Mr Macdonald. Mark Macdonald. Uh, I'm grateful for the Minister for giving way. The recent development at Dubford in my constituency has been hit by the fact that uh, inappropriate infrastructure was laid, uh, which does not allow my constituents in that area to benefit from broadband uh, internet connections. Um, while I, I'm open-minded in relation to this amendment, can the Minister advise how that could potentially be dealt with better in future to ensure new developments are catered for appropriately? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think we've got to deal with all of this in terms of changes to building standards and changes to the planning policy, and I'm committed to doing that. But setting some of these things in primary legislation uh, would actually, I think, uh, cause quite some chaos as technologies change. Uh, change. If Mr Macdonald wants to write to ministers around about the situation um, at Dubford, I'm willing to ensure that that goes into the process to ensure that similar mistakes are not made again. Uh, increasing uh, cycling for transport and leisure is a, a key policy commitment uh, for the Scottish Government. Uh, it has contributions to make to both health and well-being and combating uh, climate change. Uh, and we are putting £80 million per year into active travel provision. Uh, and we're funding cycling facilities and workplaces, public places and schools and colleges through the Places for Everyone Fund and the cycle-friendly suite of programmes. However, I can't support the introduction of such detailed requirements in primary legislation which have not been subject to any assessment or consultation to consider whether they are appropriate. The costs of the additional space required and the possible practical difficulties that might arise. I appreciate that there are powers to amend the provisions, but I don't think that it is enough to justify introducing such detailed requirements in this late stage of the bill. Ms Beamish would also want the provisions to come into force within one year of royal assent. That is very little time to develop and consult in regulations to put this right. So I do not support Mr Cole Hamilton's and Ms Beamish's amendments, and I would ask them not to press them. I move Amendment 132. Thank you very much. And I call Alex Cole Hamilton to speak to Amendment 3. I believe he's already called members' attention to the fact that a correction slip has been issued to uh, our circulated members on this amendment. Th Hampton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. My apologies again for the error in it, the original drafting of the amendment, and I hope that members now understand that this amendment would see fibre optic cable taken both from the telephone exchange to the cabinet nearest to development, and then on from the, de uh, the uh, cabinet to the development itself. Presiding Officer, um, members will see that this is titled Amendment Number Three, and that is uh, indicative of how early I laid this, and yet at no point have the minister or officials uh, attempted to approach me on this subject to address? I will. Minister. Um, I think that Mr Cole Hamilton, if he goes back to his office, uh, will find that Andy Kinnaird, uh, the bill team manager, uh, contact the office uh, to see if there was anything uh, that Mr Hamilton wanted to talk about in terms of not only his, uh, but other amendments. Alice Cole Hamilton. Oh, so apparently it is now the case that opposition members must come cap in hand to the government and not have concerns that the government may legitimately have, concerns that the government may legitimately have with members opposite amendments that they would seek to raise with them, such as the arrogant approach of the government to this bill and the stitch up they have made with the Conservatives. I want to make progress, Mr Dornan. 
all of us, all of us in this chamber will have had, all of us Order, in this please. chamber will have had meetings with organizations like BT Openreach and other providers about the exciting new benefits of 5G technology that will set to revolutionize things like home working and home gaming, entertainment and, and the rest of it. Connecting isolated communities to our bright, broader society through the benefits of digital communication. This is about future-proofing. This amendment is about future-proofing. We, all of us, probably have new-build housing developments, as Mr. McDonald described, in our constituency, constituencies, which were built without adequate IT infrastructure utility provision. Now, there are other provisions for utilities on the face of bills throughout the, the test of time. With a certain degree of trepidation, I will take an intervention. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I apologise for not raising this before. I've only just read what's before us. It, it says nothing about what should be at the other end of the fibre. It only talks about what's at the end of the development. So therefore, it would be perfectly proper to meet the requires of the amendment for the fibre simply to go down to the main road to the Cabinet and no further. In that sense, it seems a rather inadequate amendment. <laughs> Ask for Hamilton. I think, um, I think from the member's intervention, he can only have skim-read my amendment because it actually indicates that this would do both things. Um, I, I advise him to pay more attention. Um, this is about future-proofing. Kirk Liston in my constituency was built without adequate broadband provision to the Cabinet or to the premises. And for, uh, for a community just six miles from this location to suffer broadband speeds of less than half a meg in 2016 to 2017 when it was uh, addressed is frankly appalling. I, I think it is important to put things like this on the face of the bill. We aren't talking about a revolution in technology beyond the fibre optic for the foreseeable and if that comes then we can repeal this aspect of legislation. I am winding up but I will take a, a, an amendment from Mr. Mark McDonald. McDonald. I'm grateful to the member for giving me. As I said I was open-minded in relation to this. The concern I would have is that if we had been debating this, say, maybe 10 years ago, we would have been talking about copper and we would be talking about exchange to premises, such as, for example, existing King's Wells in my constituency, which is now causing great difficulty in retrofitting the infrastructure to ensure that those properties are adequately connected. So my concern would be, as Mr Hamilton talks about future-proofing, if technology moves on in the future and retrofitting were to be required, it could potentially put residents uh, and local authorities uh, at great expense in order to change that. Would he accept that as a potential flaw in this amendment? Ask Hamilton. Every single premises in the country currently served by copper for the receipt of their broadband will eventually have to have those retrofitted and their pavements dug up and the rest of it. All I am suggesting in this amendment is to future-proof that so that new builds, to which we all accept that developers will default to the use of copper because it is cheaper, um, will have to be retrofit when we roll out 5G technology. So I think this is an important step to take, signals that we are a future-minded country, and I urge the Chamber to support it. Thank you, and I call Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 202 and the other amendments of the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Here in the Parliament, we are lucky to have the benefit of safe bike storage, which is within what I have stipulated in my amendment, within 30 metres of the building. In fact, um, it is actually, as we all know, under the building. We also have the following. Um, uh, we have showers and um, what is termed in the, um, in, in the amendment, water closets rather old-fashionedly and hand-washing basins and continuous supplies of hot and cold running water. Changing rooms are provided with seating, facilities to enable a person to dry any specific clothing and any personal clo clothing or effects. Suitable and sufficient facilities to enable a person to lock away any clothing which is not taken home, the, personal, the person's own clothing which is not worn during working hours, and the person's personal effects. On-site provision and availability of uh, cycle maintenance tools. These facilities I have stipulated, as I say in my amendment, uh, we have led here by example, and I'm clear that others should have the opportunity to have similar arrangements as they cycle or indeed walk to work or run. Having good facilities is one of a range of measures which would encourage people to cycle to work, and I hope members will support this amendment on that basis. And I um, have to say that the personal 
experience of being able to use the facilities in this parliament has made a significant difference to my ability to cycle to work and that of many others who I know who also do so. There are, of course, other issues such as road segregated, um, on-road segregated cycle lanes, presumed liability laws, good um, cyclist and motor vehicle uh, um, driver education, and much more. But these are for another day. Today we can do something to enable many people who would like to cycle to work to leave their bikes safely and shower and change like we can here, leaving towels to dry and locking away our kit. I've crafted this amendment so that ministers can alter the minimum number of employees and the arrangements for these, as well as the description of the cycling facilities expected. I've deliberately not gone below 10 employees so as to not make this amendment too onerous, but this can be changed in regulation by Scottish ministers. These arrangements are based on the BREAM good practice standards, which are well respected <coughs> and well recognised. On the basis that we are in a climate emergency, I note what the Minister says about one year um, from Royal Assent, but surely this is long enough in view of the fact that the BREAM good practice standards are already in existence. And the Minister last um, yesterday made, frankly, a woefully ineffective and un unadventurous statement on the cycling future. This is an opportunity to do something positive and really robust that will help. And I say, let's go to it. Can I call Jeremy Balfour? Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I uh, speak in favour of the amendments uh, 132 and 133 in the name of the uh, Minister? Uh, this is amendments to the amendment that I put down. And can I also uh, thank Mary Fee in particular for the support uh, in bringing forward uh, these issues. Uh, this bill will do many things and uh, no doubt um, academics and lawyers and historians will look back in years to say where was it effective and where was it ineffective. And although this has not had a lot of uh, playtime within this chamber and perhaps not a lot of hot air, um, I do think, looking back, this will be something that will radically change how we see development and things going forward in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, change in place toilets uh, open up facilities uh, for older people uh, and for younger people and for disabled people to be able to go and do what you and I take uh, for granted. Um, this will have an economic benefit for the whole of Scotland where we see them, but perhaps more importantly than that, it will allow families to do things which at the moment they are not able to do. Um, if you are unsure what a change in place toilet looks like, uh, we have the uh, privilege of having one here within the Parliament or for those of you who are going to the Royal Highland Show over the next three or four days, uh, they have taken the step ahead of this bill to put them in because they see the benefit that it will bring them and that will bring the people that go to that show and other facilities. So can I again thank the Minister uh, for tidying up uh, my uh, minor mistakes and I do hope that this will give a clear sign that this Parliament wants families uh, whatever they have, whatever disabilities we have within it, to be able to go out and enjoy facilities uh, across the whole of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. And can I call on the Minister to wind up in this um, group? Thank you, President Officer. I, I've already uh, paid tribute to uh, a number of MSPs that have been involved um, in the Changing Places Toilet campaign. It would be remiss of me not to uh, mention PAMIS, who have been at the forefront of campaigning um, for a very, very long time uh, and are finally seeing uh, their efforts come to fruition, not only through um, the bill itself, but also through um, the re recent consultation uh, that has been put out uh, by the building standards um, team. Um, and some things are, are much better um, left uh, not to primary legislation, um, but to, um, uh, to secondary legislation regulation um, and I think that Mr Cole Hamilton has possibly got entirely the wrong end of the stick here because who knows for how long fibre will be the top notch technology to people's homes. I have no idea um, how that science is moving forward. Uh, I don't know if anybody in this room does um, but you know if that is in primary legislation it's going to be difficult to make that change. And Mr. MacDonald, in his retort to Mr. Cole Hamilton, was absolutely right, because we now have a situation in certain parts of the country 
where it is very difficult uh, to, 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 to make the change. Um, and what I would never do in all of this, uh, President Officer, is I would never accuse Stuart Stevenson of skim reading anything. Here, here. Uh, he is a man who knows the minutiae of everything because he reads the law, presiding yeah, officer. Here, here. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 132 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 133 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 133 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 134 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move. Uh, moved. The question is that Amendment 134 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 3 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton? Alex Cole Hamilton to move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We're going to move to a division on Amendment 3. This will be a one minute division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 3 in the name of Alex Crowell Hamilton is yes, 24, no, 89. There were six abstentions. The amend amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 202 in the name of Claudia Beamish? Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Uh, move, presiding officer. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 202 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. This will be a 30 second division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 202 in the name of Claudia Beamish is yes, 29, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 135 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Uh, moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 135 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We'll turn now to Group 26, Hill Tracks. Can I call Amendment 14 in the name of Andy Whiteman? Grouped with amendments 15, 16, 17, and 18, and Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 14 and speak to all the amendments in this group. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I move Amendment 14. Uh, for many years, uh, there have been concerns over the proliferation of bulldozed tracks. Order, please. Keep built, the quiet. Down. Sorry, built, Mr. built without planning consent to poor standards across some of our most scenic uh, landscapes. And a campaign by Scottish Environment Link and led by Rambler Scotland has been running for many, many years and they've undertaken meticulous and detailed work to catalogue this abuse and identify uh, how to affect greater public scrutiny, oversight and regulation. And they thought they had some success with the previous planning minister, Minister Derek uh, Mackay, but he disappointed uh, with timid and ineffectual reforms back in 2014. Uh, now a new report, Changing Tracks, documents the ongoing problem and the continuing failure of the planning system to deal with this. Now, as the law stands at the moment, I've got Mr. Mackay's attention, he'll recall, um, any private way 
which is the technical term for such tracks, built for the purpose of agriculture or forestry, is a permitted development under Section 30 of the Town Country Planning Scotland Act 1997. That's to say the principle of development is conceded by law and there's no requirement for full planning consent. Now, I just want to underscore an important point about my amendments 14 to 18. Not one of these amendments affects the permitted development rights that currently exist for agriculture and forestry. I've decided to pick my fights carefully and picking fights with the farming and forestry industry is not something I had the uh, capacity or inclination to do. So uh, they can uh, rest uh, assured. Any private way built for the purpose of field sports, however, is not a permitted development and requires full planning consent. In addition, in a national scenic area, there's a requirement that all private ways, with the exception of approved afforestation schemes, for whatever purpose need to apply for full planning consent. Now, in response to public concern in 2014, the law was amended uh, by Mr. Mackay to require uh, all private ways under the permitted development regime to be notified to the planning authority. There remain permitted developments, however, and there's no means of ultimately refusing their construction. Now, I've lodged amendments 14 to 18 to provide another modest reform uh, of the planning system, to improve transparency and to make some tracks subject to full planning approval that are not just now. None of these amendments bans tracks. In this respect, Scottish renewables are wrong in their briefing to suggest that they do. All tracks built by members of Scottish renewables uh, will have been through a full planning consent uh, regime. So this is not about whether there should be tracks or not. This is about the process. And this is about how much democratic scrutiny should be applied to proposals which have the capacity to be very damaging. Now, hill tracks continue to be built for field sports, despite the fact that they require planning consent due to a loophole in the law, whereby the applicant claims that they are for agricultural purposes, which of course is a permitted development. They say there's a few sheep on the hill. Now, this is very hard for a planning authority to refute, for example, and extremely difficult for them to refuse consent on that basis, and they'd be most likely to end up in court uh, if they did. Now, this loophole, therefore, is closed by Amendment 14. It doesn't change the intention of the law. It merely ensures that the current system where field sports tracks should apply for full planning consent is respected in practice and cannot be avoided. Amendments 15 to 16 provide that any track constructed in national parks on sites of special scientific interest and in Scotland's two national parks will require full consent. Now, within Scotland's national parks, there's been growing concern about the proliferation uh, of tracks. The Cairngorm National Park's current management plan contains a presumption against hill tracks. That was a management plan, incidentally, signed off by the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, but the Park Authority does not have the capacity, the planning powers, to ensure that this can be put into effect. Amendment 15 will provide that. And finally, uh, Amendment 18 is interesting. National scenic areas are the only designated site where all tracks, with the exception of approved afforestation schemes, require full planning consent. That's the situation now. And in fact, it's been the situation since 1987 when the then Scottish Development Department issued circular, a circular, uh, circular 20, uh, sorry, circular 9, 1987. And the then Secretary of State for Scotland, Malcolm Rifkind, enacted the Town and Country Planning Restriction of Permitted Development, National Scenic Areas, Scotland, Direction 1987. So my amendment, and I hope the Conservative members are listening, my amendment merely transfers the good works of Conservative Secretary of State for Scotland, Malcolm Rifkind, into primary legislation. A fitting legacy, I'm sure Conservative members uh, will, uh, will, will agree. And I hope, therefore, that Conservative members can at least support Amendment 18, uh, which merely transfers Malcolm Rifkin's intentions uh, into uh, law. Now, if these amendments are passed, they will make no difference to the permitted development rights for agriculture and forestry outside the designated areas covered by amendments 15, and 15 to 18. Presiding officer, it is worth reflecting in conclusion on the fact that a short pathway to provide access for wheelchair users to a beauty spot requires full planning consent. But a vehicle track bulldozed up the side of Scotland's prominent mountains does not. It's time that was changed. I move Amendment 14. Thank you, Mr Wyman. And I call Edward Mountain. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I wish to speak to these amendments regarding hill tracks and the creation of these tracks. Before I do so, I should declare that I'm a surveyor and also a member of the RICS, who I think have responded to this. I should also refer members to my register of interest in land. <clears throat> these amendments seek to amend the legislation on Class 18 permitted development under the General Development Order. This allows for the formation, as, as Mr. Whiteman has said, an alteration of maintenance of private ways. But this Parliament should be under no illusion that tracks can be built anywhere for any purpose. They simply cannot. The current process requires the developer to notify the local planning authority of their intention to create a track for agriculture and forestry through a prior notification process. Whilst there is no public consultation, and consent is deemed to be given after 28 days, the planning authority, of course, can object, which they often do, calling the, process, calling the application in for full consultation. Now, Mr... Uh, I, I will certainly take a, an intervention from Mr. And, Andy Wayland. I thank the member for taking intervention. Mr. Mr. Mountain will be, uh, I'm sure, aware of the report by Scottish Environment Link on changing tracks, which actually demonstrates, uh, based on a, a large number of prior notifications that have been put in, that actually the process is very ineffectual in providing public scrutiny uh, of, of, of these developments. Edward Mountain. Well, because the process seems to be failed, in Mr. Whiteman's opinion, it doesn't mean that the process is wrong and needs amending. It means that the people who implement the process have to carry out the process in a proper way. Now, Mr. Whiteman's amendment on 14 seeks to prevent the building of tracks for shooting and other field sports. Let me be very clear. The current legislation already prevents this, as the current permitted development is for agriculture and forestry, not shooting or field sports. Thus, the amendment is not required, and what he is seeking to ban is already banned. Mr. Whiteman's Amendment 15 seeks to remove the permitted development order in national parks. Again, this is not required as national parks can determine their own policy. And if they need, feel the need to refuse all prior notifications and call them in, making them go through the full planning process, all they have to do is instruct their planning officers to do that. And this is the same in the case in Amendments 16, 17 and 18. And that is why I do not support these amendments, because I do not believe they are required. What is required, Mr. Whiteman, and I would probably agree with you on, that planning authorities do the job that they're supposed to do with the legislation that they have. And if they did that, this wouldn't be an issue. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call the Minister, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, permitted development rights are set out in the Town and Country Planning General Permit Permitted Development Scotland Order 1992 as amended over the years and that's commonly referred to as the GPDO. Uh, there are permitted development rights for agriculture and forestry private ways but, and I should stress this, there are not and never have been permitted development rights for shooting and field sports. I do understand the, the concerns around hill tracks and their potential for negative impacts on visual amenity and the environment. However, uh, we must also consider the needs of farmers and foresters who need access to their land for their regular operations, including planting and harvesting and reaching remote grazing areas. National parks, national scenic areas, uh, I'll, I'll take Mr. Mountain. Edward Mountain. Very grateful for you taking the interruption. I, I, I wondered if you felt it would be appropriate that there should be a standard laid out for the construction of these tracks, which would provide good guidance to people doing it, and that would further enhance the, what the planners can do as far as people who don't build them correctly. I'll, I'll come to that yes. point at the very end, uh, if you don't mind. Um, national parks, national scenic areas, and triple SIs cover something like 20% of Scotland. Uh, and these areas are no empty landscapes. Uh, removing permitted development rights in all of that land uh, would impact on significant numbers of rural businesses in areas that are often economically fragile already. And during the course of stage two, um, and even today uh, and yesterday with Ms Grant's amendments, one of the things which I'm sure we want to see is the repopulation of certain areas we don't want to tip folk over the edge uh, and make their living in particular parts of Scotland unsustainable. I do agree 
um, that we need to look at this again uh, and to make sure that we have the balance right and maybe take on board some of the suggestions that Mr Mountain has said around about actual, actually creating a standard um, for um, these kind of ways. Um, unlike most planning uh, legislation, which is largely procedural, permitted development orders grant or limit planning permission. So decisions about permitted development rights need to be taken following careful consideration of the impacts whether that be impacts on the environment or impacts on people's need to be able to go about their daily business. For that reason, the place to consider amending permitted development rights is through the GPDO and not by amendment to this bill. That allows for a thorough consultation that gives all parties a fair chance to have their views heard and with full impact assessments. The government has already committed to a wide review of the GPDO following the completion of this bill. Uh, we will consider the potential for changes to permitted development for private ways and I can assure the Chamber that we will get started on that quickly. I would ask members to reject these amendments and allow us to give, uh, allow us to give proper consideration to all of the impacts before making such changes. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Andy Whiteman to wind up and to press a withdrawal amendment 14. I thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Mr. Mountain referred to, to banning things. Um, rather like earlier um, amendments and short-term lets, the planning system doesn't ban anything. Um, I've got no power to ban anything. This Parliament's got no power to ban anything through the planning system. What we're trying to do is make sure that the planning system can operate effectively. And it is up to local authority, planning authorities to decide for themselves whether they're going to grant applications, refuse applications, grant them with modifications or not. So let's just be very, very clear uh, about that. Um, he says correctly, and I, I, I made uh, this point in my opening remarks, that field sports are not a permitted development. But the problem is that the system is being wild, wi widely abused because land that's used for field sports is often and frequently used for, quotes, agriculture. Because there are, for example, sheep on grouse moors that act as tick mops. And the very presence of those sheep mean that that land is used for agriculture and people are putting in field, uh, uh, hill tracks actually for field sports but pretending they're for agriculture. And a very good example of that was at Ledgown Estate in Wester Ross where the uh, Highland Council was assured by the, by the landowner that this was for agriculture. One year later, the estate was put on the market, and in the sales particulars, they crowed about the network of tracks that were available to permit shooting on the estate. That's an actual example of blatant abuse of the current permitted development. I will. Edward Mountain. Mr. Whiteman, thank you very much for taking the intervention. Would you, do you not agree with me that if, if, if a planning authority is seriously concerned that the track is not being built for agricultural policy, uh, sorry, agricultural forestry, they could call in the planning application and demand that the applicant makes a full application so it can be properly scrutinised? Do you deny that? Andy Whiteman. They, they didn't have the they, 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 they attempted to do that, but they could not provide the evidence that would refute the claim that this was for agriculture without ending up in court. And that is because of the way the law applies. And Amendment 14 is a reworded provision that makes it, will make it much, much clearer land on which you require a full planning uh, application. Um, now, the minister again said, yes, exactly, there are no permitted development rights for field sports. But as I've just made the point in respect of Mr. Mountain's comments, uh, he knows that there's no way under the current regime that this can be properly enforced. I'll take an, an intervention. Mike Rumbles. Would he agree with me that clarifying, that's what I think this is doing, clarifying the law in this way would take the controversy away and that this is not an attack on shooting in field sports, but it's a proposal to make sure that the, pr the process of building tracks are properly looked at. Andy White. Yes, I welcome that in intervention. I mean, Mr Rumbles is perfectly correct. Uh, many planning authorities are attempting to deal with this problem, uh, but they haven't got effective powers or resources to do so. And all I am attempting to do is make sure that the process facilitates uh, an informed uh, decision that is subject to full public scrutiny. And in many instances, they will consent to these, these, these tracks. I mean, I do not have a view as to whether these tracks should be built. That's a matter properly uh, for planning uh, authorities. Now, the minister says 
he's going to have a look, at, a look again at this through the GDPO. I mean, the problem here is we had a look in 2012. No meaningful reforms came forward. I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I'm not uh, in the government. I cannot bring forward secondary legislation on permitted development rights. I don't know when they will ever be brought forward. I have no idea what the government's intentions are uh, here. This has been... this. This topic has been on the political agenda now for over two years. Ministers have had plenty of opportunity to say that they uh, are going to do something through this bill, uh, and they've chosen not to. Even the modest reform, even the modest reform of extending the, the direction that exists over national scenic areas to national parks would be a modest reform to actually address the very concerns that planning officers have in those national parks where they try and create a presumption, but at the end of the day, they cannot effectively implement uh, that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wind up there, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Whiteman. And the question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We will move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. This will be a one-minute division. Amendment 14. The result of the vote on amendment number 14 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 30, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 15 and ask Mr Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. <coughs> this is amendment 15. The result on the vote on Amendment 15 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes 30, no 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 16? Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. Amendment 16. The result of the vote on amendment number 16 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes 29, no 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 17, amend Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 17 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 30, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 18 in the name of Andy Whiteman? Andy Whiteman to move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast the votes now. Amendment 18. The result of the vote on amendment number 18 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 30, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 203 in the name of Claudia Beamish? Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Move, presiding officer. That is moved. The question is that amendment 203 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now on amendment 203. The result of the vote on amendment number 203 in the name of Claudia Beamish is yes, 29, no, 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We're going to turn now to group 27, the call-in of applications by Scottish ministers. I will call amendment 136 and 137 in the name of the minister. Minister to move amendment 136 and speak to both. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, occasionally there are reasons for a planning minister to call in and decide uh, a planning application. Uh, this is a long-established power in the planning system exercised by successive governments. It's a responsibility that I take seriously uh, and a power that I use very, very sparingly. Um, I fully respect the lead role played by our planning authorities and it is absolutely right that the vast majority of planning applications are decided by them. Sometimes, though, circumstances arise where it may be more appropriate for further scrutiny and decision at the national level, because in some way the proposed development raises issues of national importance. Those issues cannot be easily or comprehensively listed in advance. It comes down to the individual circumstances of individual cases. Section 16A uh, was added to the bill at stage two through an amendment by Mark Ruskell. It requires uh, ministers to set out the possible circumstances uh, in which they would consider calling in uh, applications and regulations. I agree uh, there can and should be uh, greater clarity of the circumstances which may lead to call-in, but that can be much more reasonably and helpfully explained <coughs> excuse me, through the open text of a statement than it can be in legislation. Mark Ruskell and I have discussed this change uh, and I'm very grateful uh, for his input and agreement that this requirement can be handled through a ministerial statement. That is what amendments 136 and 137 do, and I hope members will support them. And I move amendment 136, presiding officer. Thank you very much. <coughs> and no other member wishes to contribute. So the question is that amendment 136 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I ask the minister to move amendment 137? Thank you. The question is that Amendment 137 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are. I'll turn now to Group 28, the determination of applications, and I call Amendment 204 in the name of Alec Rowley, grouped with Amendment 138, and Alec Rowley to move Amendment 204. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. In moving Amendment 204, this amendment uh, would, would require the planning authorities must record whether a decision on an application complies with the local development plan and if not why that decision was in the public interest 
and in line with planning policy guidance. Amendment 204 was submitted in response to criticism of Section 16b, which was introduced at Stage 2, to require planning authorities to state in a decision notice whether a planning decision complies with the Local Development Plan. Such a provision is incredibly important to supporting a plan-led system, allowing for full transparency regarding how many applications the authority has accepted that contravene the local development plan. It is vital both the community and developers have faith in the validity of the plan, otherwise there is no incentive to engage in the development of the local development plan. This amendment would give that transparency, and I think that is important. Thank you very much. I call Andy Whiteman. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Amendment 138 removes section 16b uh, in the bill. Uh, 16, six, section 16b was added at stage 2 following an amendment tabled by myself, and its intention at the time was to form the basis for triggering a reformed appeal system, which the substance of which we'll debate uh, in the next group. Put simply, Section 16b in the Bill requires a statement to accompany each planning decision outlining whether the planning authority consider the decision to be in accordance with the development plan. Depending on the answer to that question, the relevant appeal right to be discussed in the next group uh, would be uh, triggered. Now, regardless of the fate of those uh, appeal rights, and I'm not expecting them to pass uh, Parliament to approve them, we'll debate them in the next group, uh, I would nevertheless urge members to uh, support the retention uh, of Section 16b and vote against Amendment 138. Like many members, and Alex Rowley has mentioned this, I want a proper plan-led system. Now, the extent of discretion in the current planning system undermines, in my view, such a plan-led system. And I know we, we differ uh, on the extent to which we should have discretion in the planning system. I accept this should always be an element of discretion. In my view, there is too much. But regardless of where we stand uh, on that question, uh, retaining Section 16b will enable us to capture st statistics um, which will be useful in monitoring the extent to which determinations are being made that are compliant with the plan or not, and therefore um, uh, be able to take a view as to the extent to which we actually, in practice, have a plan-led system. Now, Alex Rowley's Amendment 204 amends Section 16b in a manner which I, I don't think is helpful. Uh, subsection A merely rewords Section 16b, and B is unnecessary, in my view, as all decisions will, be, will narrate in some detail as to why they've been made anyway. Um, so I'd ask Alex Rowley not to press Amendment 204, uh, but if he does, um, he's perfectly entitled uh, to do so. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whiteman. And I call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 138 and the other amendments in this group. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, I recognise uh, that the real motive behind these provisions uh, is not to bring clarity to the reasons for decisions, but to provide that hook uh, for the amendments on appeal rights, which we are to discuss next. Superficially on its own, Section 16b seems fairly minor and straightforward, setting out something a planning authority must state in its decision notice. But an authority must always have regard to both the provisions of the development plan and any other material considerations when making a decision on a planning application. This is a long-standing requirement at the very heart of our planning system. And the decision on every application is to be made in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Decision on applications always involve the decision maker reaching a conclusion about whether and how the proposed development accords with the development plan and considering that alongside an assessment of other material considerations to decide whether they, individually or collectively, outweigh the position with development plan conformity. Authorities already uh, must give reasons for their decisions and reports which are published on the Register of Applications, setting out the provisions of the development plan and the other material considerations to which uh, they have had regard. So explaining only the position in relation to the development plan in the decision notice will not increase transparency. It will only create confusion by giving a partial picture of the reasons for the decision. 
I note that Mr O'Reilly has attempted to address that issue uh, by requiring further information to be included, but without using the term material considerations. During the passage of this bill, nobody has proposed removing material considerations from the decision process, and rightly so. So I'm not clear why people are so shy of giving them their place. For those reasons, I ask members to reject Amendment 204 and to support Amendment 138. Thank you very much, Minister. I call Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, and this is where I part company with the, the Minister. <laughs> it, it, ha it had to happen. It had to happen. Amendment 138 strips out something that we put in at stage two, um, which, uh, which is very, a, a very simple uh, matter, which says that councils much, must state why a development is or is not in accordance with a development plan. Um, it always used to be the case that they had to do this. It's not onerous. Um, they have to give reasons in a decision notice in any case. Um, and I do disagree with the Minister. It uh, does um, help transparency. So we'll be voting against 138, but we'll also be voting against 204, um, because I think uh, Mr Rowley's wording is not quite right. Uh, and uh, it goes too far. So we'll be voting against both. Thank you, Mr Simpson. Colin Allegrowley to wind up in this group. Thank you, President Officer. I think the important point the, the Minister actually said about the real motive, he needs to tell me what the real motive he thinks is, because the bottom line is that a front-led planning system that engages communities, communities put a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of resources into, and before, uh, before the ink is dry on the local development plan, developers come in with an application that completely ignores the development plan. And that's why people have lost faith in the planning process. Minister. I, I spelt out in my speech, um, President Officer, um, it's fine in terms of the development plan uh, and the de deviation from the development plan, but if it doesn't spell out the material considerations for the reasoning about the decision, uh, which Mr Rowley doesn't want to see, that's not open and transparent. Um, and that is what, why I think the amendment in his name is not right. Alec Rowley. And I think the fact that, that it looks like the Minister is going to lose in terms of 138, because we'll be certainly uh, moving and voting against that, I will not be moving the motion in my name 204. Not moving. Not right. moving. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. Uh, is, are, is the Chamber happy for Ms, Mr Rowley to withdraw that amendment? Yes, yes we are. Can I call Amendment 138 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Uh, moved, President Officer. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 138 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. And members may cast their votes now. This will be a one-minute division. Again, first division following a debate. The result of the vote on amendment number 138 in the name of the Minister is yes, 58, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We're going to turn now to group 29, which is the right to appeal against planning decisions. 
Can I call Amendment 160 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with Amendments 161, 205 and 223. Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 160 and to speak to all the other amendments. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. I move Amendment um, 160. Yeah. Um, so, as members know, there's been a long debate about whether to reform appeal rights. And, uh, given the um, length of this debate, now six hours, 42 minutes, I don't intend to rehearse in full all those arguments uh, once more. But I do, do think it's important to put on record, uh, in a stage three debate, once again in the second planning bill of this parliament, um, the core um, uh, arguments. Now, current appeal rights in the planning system date from the 1947 Act. Applicants then, typically landowners themselves, were suspicious of the ability of public authorities to make decisions about development. Uh, they had just, uh, public authorities, local authorities, had just got this uh, power in the nationalization of development that came under the 1947 Act. And rightly, uh, landowners were suspicious um, of the uh, ability and motives of these new public authorities with rights over their own land. And therefore, the right to develop one's, because the right to develop one's own property was being removed from the owner, it was conceded at the time, correctly in my view, that a right of appeal should be granted against any refusal to grant planning consent. But that was 70 years ago. Today we have a, a plan, almost a plan-led system, not quite a plan-led system, we're moving to one, but it's a much more plan-led system than it was in 1947. And there is really no requirement for appeals to be universally available to applicants. Equally, there is a strong argument to provide a limited right of appeal to third parties. Now, I think the debate on third party right of appeal has moved on since the 2006 Act. It's now focused on equalizing the rights of appeal by first providing a limited right of appeal to third parties, but also to restrict the existing rights of appeal to applicants. Now, in a proper plan-led system, and such things do exist in continental Europe, uh, there should be no rights of appeal at all, and indeed there are none. The plan should make clear what's permitted and what's not. But we're still in the world, as we've just heard in the previous section, of discretion, material considerations, and unallocated sites and all the rest of it. So my amendments 160 and 161 are identical to those lodged at stage two, um, when they were rejected by three votes against, two votes for, and two abstentions by Conservative members. So I'm grateful to the presiding officer for allowing these to come back at stage three, um, when we can perhaps resolve uh, the Conservatives' own um, abstention at the point they were unsure about where they wanted to go. So we'll, we'll learn where they have got to um, in a few moments. Amendment 160 provides that where a planning authority give notice that an application is not in accordance with the development plan under the provisions of section 716B, which we've just voted to retain, then the existing appeal right of applicants would be removed. In other words, there's no right of appeal on an application that violates the development plan. The right of appeal remains open to applicants where a planning authority refuse consent for an application which is in accordance with the plan. Amendment 161 introduces a similar right to third parties to appeal determinations where consent is granted to an application that's not in accordance with the plan and where a decision is made on land in which the planning authority has an interest. Now these amendments are very tightly framed and in my view will build in trust uh, to the planning system and move us more towards a plan-led system. Now, as I said, the debate has matured over recent years. It's abundantly clear that the current system of appeals is undermining local democratic decision-making by allowing legitimate decisions made by planning authorities to be appealed against the wishes of the local communities, against the wishes of officials, against the wishes of members of the planning authority and against the planning authority itself uh, when they wish to uphold agreed plans. Now, I note that Alex Rowley has lodged Amendment 205 on third party right of appeal, but none, uh, no amendment on the existing right of appeal. Nevertheless, we will support Amendment 205 if my amendments 161 and 160 are rejected. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I call Alex Rowley to speak to Amendment 205 and the other amendments. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the amendments 205 and 223 introduce equal rights of appeal. Developers and communities can appeal when a decision is approved that doesn't comply with the local development plan. On appeal rights, our guiding principle is that the planning system is not operating on a level playing field and that the system is in desperate need of reform. 
However, equal rights of appeal was a notable omission from the Bill as first drafted. Our proposed amendments give communities a right of appeal when development is approved contrary to the local development plan. Our proposals also seek to strengthen the plan-led system by limiting the applicant's right of appeal. Despite promises made in 2006, the problem of a lack of community engagement in the planning system has endured. The Government's own review concluded that front-loading consultation had not worked and during the committee sessions ahead of the Bill, City of Edinburgh Council argued that the limited system of front-loading that we have has not been enough to generate community trust and confidence in the planning system. If planning authorities are to create places that people want to live in, there must be early and meaningful engagement of communities and real community influence in local development plans. However, as it stands, early engagement could take place and be reflected in the local development plan, but have no influence on final outcomes because of developers' right of appeal. Currently, the only route for the public is to take court action and judicial review is too expensive for most people and can place a large burden on local communities. With such a weak link between public input and decision making and no mechanisms to, to, for the public to hold developers to account, there is very little incentive for the public to get involved in planning. A local development plan led right of appeal as we are proposing will encourage both communities and developers to get involved in the drafting because they know they will be subject to the plan at the end of the process. It is disappointing that this bill has made no meaningful attempt to shift some power away from developers and ministers into the hands of communities. And this is an issue that we will continue to campaign on because communities up and down Scotland who have participated in the local development plan have given up their time, their resources to have an input into how their communities can be shaped and then see before the ink is dry on those plans, developers coming forward and completely ignoring the plans button ahead with their proposals. That's not right. People have been left feeling very bitter and very betrayed who did compete, complete in that process. And therefore, therefore, I would urge... Yeah. Sandra White. Thank the member for taking intervention. I know his last comments, people being left feeling disappointed and betrayed. And I mean no disrespect by the comments I will be making. But I, a number of years ago, the MSP tried to introduce a third party right of appeal in a private member's bill, and the Labour Party opposed it. So I feel quite betrayed in that particular part. Alec Rowley. But I think, you know, I, I think that's, that's, that's the point and, and the very excellent con uh, introduction that Andy uh, Whiteman made. Time moves on. It must be the experience. It must be, surely it must be the experience of most MSPs in this place who are shouting and waving their hands, Mr Doran. Surely, surely it is the experience where you've come across planning applications in communities and the community has had no say. They're left feeling powerless. Now, I'm not going to stand here today because some Labour MSP back years ago didn't support your private members bill and say that we shouldn't get it right this time round. Communities up and down Scotland, if we want to have the people have the confidence in the planning system, then you need to address this issue. I understand that the Tories and SNP are going to come together today to block this and not listen to communities. Well, I hope you pay the price for that. Thank you. Can I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Neil Findlay?
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I'm speaking in, in this section of the amendments because this is an issue of huge importance to my constituents. They have been in touch with me in huge numbers in advance of this bill because uh, the reality is, for my constituents and indeed communities across Scotland, they feel the planning system is simply stacked against them. Indeed, at a, local, a recent local meeting I was at, I had to correct someone. People were tried describing the planning system as a marathon, not a sprint. But the reality is, for too many people, it's neither of those things. It's a siege. Because the reality is that communities have to get their activities, their actions, their coordinated uh, campaigns right and defend every single time, whereas developers only need to get that right once. And the, the experience of communities, uh, both in my constituency and elsewhere, that they just receive application after application for the same sites, and they have no redress. And that's why it matters, because that's the experience, experience at Craig House, and it's the, certainly the worry that my constituents have regarding Midmar Paddock and the fields in Liberton. And the, the reality is that the planning system is not infallible. That's why appeals exist in the first place. So if it is right for developers to be able to appeal planning decisions, to question the decisions and the, the, the basis on which they were made, surely it is also right for communities to be able to question those self-same decisions. And this is not an unfettered veto. It is a proportionate measure, as both Alec Rowley and Andy Whiteman have set out, for communities to be able to, with reference to the plan, question the decisions that have been made. Because, and indeed, again, as Alec Rowley has pointed out, front-loading front simply has not worked. And ultimately, this is a way that we can incentivise developers and indeed planners to consult more adequately, to get this right, because they will recognise that there is this ability for communities to appeal. And ultimately, this is about upholding a plan-led system and making sure that communities have a stake in that. Thank you. Thank you. And can I call Neil Findlay to be followed by Murdo Fraser? Neil uh, thanks, President Officer. I'm speaking to support Alec Rayleigh's amendments. Uh, following my involvement in a number of local planning controversies, I became aware that, the planning, that planning was the root of many controversies, not only in the area I represent, but throughout the country as a whole. Time and again, uh, applications have been approved despite considerable local opposition. Many of those involved in these campaigns, interest groups as well as ordinary folk, believe the system to be unfair and heavily skewed in favour of developers. <coughs> Excuse me. They point out, rightly in my view, the inherent unfairness of a system in which developers have the right to appeal when applications are rejected, whilst objectors do not have the same right when applications are approved. The imposition of controversial applications in the face of considerable human, uh, community opposition has engendered increased bitterness and alienation with the political system. To restore public confidence, not only with the planning system, but with the political system as a whole, we must trust the people and give them the power to have real influence in decisions that affect our local communities. I believe introducing third-party right of appeal would be an excellent first step in the process. Now, these could have been my words as they reflect my experience as an activist and as a councillor and as an MSP. But of course, they aren't my words. They are the words of Sandra White when she introduced her third, planning, pl uh, third party planning rights of appeal bill in 2003. A bill sponsored by Alec Neil and Linda Fabiani and Christine Graham. And I'm sure, I'm sure as men and women of principle and in the interests of consistency, they will be supporting our amendments today because let me tell you this, at that time when I was an activist, I supported her bill against the Labour government because I believed it was right. And, I, and today, today I will support this amendment. I wonder if the same people sitting in the government backbenches will stick to their principles and support it today. Because, President Officer, change is desperately needed. All of the power in the planning system lies with developers. They have the money to engage consultants, to hire P PR companies, to have pre-application exhibitions and to buy off opposition. They have the right to appeal against refusals and often do, but communities don't. How can anyone think this is fair? The minister earlier referred to people's human rights. How does he think that this respects people's human rights? In my then council ward, I had 16 applications for large-scale industrial development in a very short space of time. Landfill sites, open cast coal sites, mineral extraction, recycling operations, 
and numerous wind farm applications. Many, many of these were speculative. Some were opposed by the community with hundreds and hundreds of objections. They were opposed by neighbours, opposed by planners, opposed by councillors, and then appealed and approved by reporters acting on behalf of ministers. How on earth can that be fair? And it happens, as everyone here knows, in every one of our constituencies across the country. There is no level playing field. The cards are stacked against communities from the outset, and it's unfair, and it's unjust, and it is wrong. And I say to SNP members today, you have this choice to side with communities and introduce fairness into a heavily skewed system, or you can side with the Conservative Party and the big business and landed interests who want to keep things as they are because it suits them nicely. Thank you very much. It's clear in this bill that many cosy deals are being done between the Tory and SNP front benches. And let me say this, if members here choose, if they choose to side with the Conservative Party and the SNP over, a, over this planning issue of rights of appeal, given the thousands of emails that we've had from people in the community who are concerned about this, they will pay a heavy price, I, can, I would say. Thank you. And can I call Murder Fraser to be followed by Monica Lennon. Murder Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I wanted to speak on these uh, amendments in this group and the question of third party right of appeal. This is a perennial issue. It is not the first time this Parliament has considered the matter. I'm a veteran of the debates in session two of this Parliament, uh, the 20 2006 Planning Act as it became when we discussed these very points and we heard passionate speeches like the ones we've just heard from Daniel Johnson, uh, Neil Finlay and Alec Rowley on these very issues, not being made from the Labour benches, but being made from the SNP benches. Because back in that time, we had a Labour Liberal administration uh, in this place, a Labour Liberal administration strongly holding the line against these calls for equal right of appeal. And we saw the SNP in opposition making the arguments why this should be brought in. And now, of course, the positions have switched over completely. And the Labour Party and opposition are arguing for this, and the SNP and government are arguing against it. So there's one word, Mr Finlay, for the Labour position today, and that is opportunism. Because you didn't take that view when you were in party in government. Of course, I'll give way. Mr Finlay. I did take that position. I argued <laughs> against the Labour <laughs> government at the time. So you're wrong in that, and admit you're wrong. Murder Fraser. Well, Mr Finlay, I appreciate you were not in this chamber at that time, but these seats were full <laughs> of your Labour Party colleagues <laughs> at that time, holding the line against third party right of appeal. And in contrast, Order, in please. contrast to all these parties slithering and swithering around <laughs> on this issue, the Scottish Conservatives have been very clear in our view. No, not just now, thank you. We, we will not support uh, third party right of appeal, and we do so for very good reasons. Let me spell out what our view is. I am very sympathetic to the calls we hear from community groups about the planning system. I'm very sympathetic to the view that there's a lack of say in planning decisions. I'm very sympathetic to the argument that, that, that they feel the planning system is weighted against them. Developers can come in, well-resourced developers with deep pockets, with teams of lawyers and planning consultants, and against that, the community, very often just a group of uh, private individuals with limited means, are having to fight against this juggernaut of uh, developers. And they feel it's an unfair fight. And I recognize the points that uh, Daniel Johnson made about the way communities often feel about the planning process. But third-party right of appeal is not the answer to that problem not least because it comes at the end of the process, when the decisions have already been made. It is too late then to kick the thing towards Scottish ministers, in my view. That is the wrong time to try and address these concerns. Um, I'll, well, I'll give it to Mr Rowley first. Yeah. Mr Rowley. I thank um, um, Mr Fraser for giving way. Is he aware of, in his own region, the uh, fight by the community of Aberdour, a community which has participated in the whole front loading right from the start of the process that, that then went to the local area committee of democratically elected councillors, that his own party have two 
two councillors in Aberdour, both of which have condemned the fact that despite it going through the local development plan, the developer came along, put in an application, appealed it to Scottish ministers, and that house and application has been awarded. Is he aware of that? Murder Fraser. Well, I, am, I am aware of that situation. I could quote him numerous other similar examples, but I do not believe this is the answer. And if you'll, if you'll bear with me, I'll explain why I don't believe this is the answer, and I'll explain what we think the answer is. Because the other problem with an equal right of appeal, or, or even a limited uh, third-party right of appeal, is what it adds to the planning system is additional delay and additional cost. And we do need to have a country that is open for business and open for development. Because if we're going to have a growing economy, we need to be encouraging development in the right places. And you know, members in this chamber will be well aware, and will have been uh, lobbied by representatives from right across uh, the business sector. Uh, as to why bringing this in will simply complicate things further. The biggest concern people have about the planning system on all sides is the, the complexity of it and the question of delay. And the solution is not to add an extra layer of complexity and to add yet more delays into the system. So I don't support these amendments, but I do recognise there's a serious issue to be dealt with. And we are proposing a better approach because we will, in a short time, be discussing Amendment 146 in the name of my colleague, Graham Simpson, which introduces the concept of mediation in disputes between communities and developers and encourages constructive engagement early in the process. And it seems to me that is a better way to proceed. No, no, I'm just closing, Mr. Mr. Finlay. But it seems to me that is a better way to proceed because it allows these issues to be dealt with early on in the process rather than be tacked on at the end and add this extra level of complexity and cost and delay. So I would encourage members to reject uh, these amendments, and we at least will be consistent with the view that we held in 2006. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in this debate, we've heard a lot about power, and planning is very much where power is, is exercised. So we know about the, the, the stakeholders in this debate and this uh, whole issue who have lots of power and lots of rights, and those who don't have so much. And we are here to speak for our communities. Um, we have a, a planning system which approves, I think, over 96% of planning applications. So we have a very positive and permissive planning system. I think many of us have talked about the fact we want that to be a plan-led approach. But as Andy Whiteman has spelled out, it is a highly discretionary system. Um, so Labour uh, in this uh, debate around this bill have argued for a plan-led system but also a rights-based system. Now, I um, wasn't around uh, the Parliament in 2005-2006 when the, the, the planning bill was, was passed. I was working as a planning officer then. I think a lot has changed in terms of how we talk about um, community empowerment, how the relationship has changed between central and local government. Um, we're trying to get away from that top-down approach. But there are people who would argue that there shouldn't be an a, a appeal system at all. But I think it is right that we do have checks and balances. But right now, the opportunity for appeal rests only with developers. And communities do feel that's unfair. Now, what we've put forward is, is a proportionate um, solution. It's not about if you fall out with your neighbour, you get to put in an appeal. So I, I, I'm listening to the, the point about mediation, but I think that's a little bit patronising. We're talking about, you know, big proposals like incinerators. Now, I know in this chamber, colleagues like Richard Lyle, Claire Hawkey, Christina McKelvey, Fulton McGregor, James Kelly, Claudia Beamish have all had um, some experience of incinerators, I think um, Aileen Campbell too. And we have situations where developers with deep pockets are able to make um, not just repeat um, appeals, but repeat applications. And communities feel worn down by that. And I really don't believe that, that mediation is the answer to that. Um, I'm sure my colleague Alec Rowley won't mind me saying that, that I um, take slight issue with the, the framing of this as, as third party rights. I think we should be talking about equal rights of appeal. And Andy Whiteman's uh, point about equalising, I think, is really important. The point is that this is not 2005, 2006. We have to look at and reflect on how well planning legislation is working. 
And I believe that colleagues in the chamber at the time would have, if I can just uh, briefly, um, Mark Ruskell, say I think colleagues at the time would have in good faith looked at the proposals around front loading and hoped that that would have gone some way to change the culture. Mark Ruskell. For giving way, I mean, would, would the member agree with me that an unlimited right of appeal for developers actually undermines those good developers who are working with the local development planning process, are doing all that front loading work, and do actually have sites within the local development plan to develop? It's actually penalising private business as well. Yeah, I'm I think that there. unfettered right of appeal uh, for, for applicants can cause a lot of the delay and the uncertainty, uh, particularly for, for, for neighbouring sites, because the reality is that some of these appeals are in the system for a very long time, in some case years. If I can just make the point about the incinerator in Whitehill, which people have heard me talk about before, and we've had a, a members' debate, that that's an ongoing issue um, that's been going on since 2013, which was a year after I became the local councillor in that area, or one of them. And I have to say, colleagues across the political divide worked very closely on that. Um, the late councillor uh, Lynn Adams, an SNP councillor who sadly passed away. Um, Lynn was instrumental in working with the community, with myself and other Labour colleagues and, and, and Margaret Mitchell, who I didn't mention earlier. So I think there is a lot of unity around these issues. Um, but we have a situation where repeat appeals, repeat applications. I know the Minister has heard me say this before, but how can it be fair that these applicants keep coming back when it's not in accordance with the, the local development plan, it's not in accordance with Scottish planning policy, so there's no local or national justification in policy terms or in strategy for these applications. But the, the remedy uh, to uh, communities is to try and raise funds to go for judicial review, which we know is a very limited route in any case. So the one in Whitehill, the, the Minister will know that the uh, applicant or the know, can I ask Ms Lennon to bring her marks to a conclusion? Has just, withdrawn, has just withdrawn that appeal, but that's not the end of the story because they've dug a trench and they've got an, ex an existing consent. So the point is for communities, there's no peace of mind and there's no incentive to get back out there and get involved. So if we want front loading, if we want communities to genuinely be part of plan making, then we have to get the balance right. And I'm afraid that we don't. And the previous planning act hasn't achieved that. We haven't seen that planning um, transformation. We haven't seen the resource go into community empowerment. And I really would strongly urge colleagues uh, to, to listen to communities, to listen to planning democracy and support the amendments in Andy Whiteman and Alec Rowley's name. Thank you very much, Ms Lennon. Can I call Patrick Harvey? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I hadn't intended to, to speak uh, on these amendments and I, will, and I will try to do so briefly. Uh, but the 2006 Act has been mentioned repeatedly in this discussion. And, and I was a member of the parliamentary committee that was scrutinising that piece of legislation when it was going through in my, my first two or three years as a, as a member of the Scottish Parliament. And I well remember the arguments around appeal rights. And I made the case alongside colleagues from a number of political parties that if we wanted successful, active engagement up front community consultation, participation in the early stages of the planning process, we were more likely to achieve that if communities knew and developers knew that at the end of the day, the community would have a right of appeal. And we were more likely to undermine that active upfront engagement by continuing with the unlevel playing field that we have at the moment with a, a developer appeal right and no community appeal right. And I suspect this is not a matter of disagreement, really, between Labour and the SNP. I know people have had a lot of fun winding each other up about the fact that parties have changed their position. I think this is a, a difference between government and backbenchers, principally. I suspect it's always going to be the case that a planning minister of any political party will find themselves under pressure from civil servants or from vested interests and say that appeal rights are not the right thing to do. And I think that's what happened to, to the Labour Party at the time. And I suspect backbenchers who are more interested in representing their communities of any political persuasion will find themselves drawn to the argument for fairer appeal rights. And in fact, if I remember rightly, Pauline McNeill and Sandra White very often found themselves on the same side of that argument uh, against the position of the government of the day. And I hope uh, that members who take seriously their, uh, their 
uh, interest in representing communities will continue to make this argument against the government of the day. Because when that bill was passed without community appeal rights, I well remember that members across the political parties, including a large number of SNP members, at, at public meetings and hustings then and since, have said that they had not given up on the principle of levelling that playing field, would continue to make the case for equalising appeal rights, including community appeal rights, and I would just ask the Minister, is he really asking his own party colleagues to break those long-standing promises that we made to communities over many, many years? And very briefly, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wasn't intending to speak either, but as a previous... Well, you can sigh, but this is very important. As a previous community activist before becoming an MSP, having fought for seven years alongside an ex-mining village and uh, as a community councillor, uh, alongside Clydesdale District Council, to try to stop an open cast application. And people were worn down and worn down and worn down. And this happens again and again and again. It can be, as Monica Lennon has said, a war of attrition. And it's between very, very unequal groups. Often communities can feel exhausted by repeat applications and by the, the difficulties of raising money to get to a judicial review such as is happening and has happened with Patterson's and Crag in my constituency and region recently for gravel extraction on the Clyde. And often applications are made near marginalised communities such as happened with the open cast in the past. And farmers were worn down and frankly, gradually bought off by the company. And this is not a, a place where anyone should be in a civilised country. It is shameful that the Scottish Government is not on the side of the people on this. And an application for a development in the right place is actually nothing to fear. And I feel very sad that this day has come in our Parliament. I call the Minister to the Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, the Scottish Government's position on third party right of appeal has been clear and consistent. Uh, quite simply, uh, we do not support its introduction, uh, nor do we support any restrictions on the current right of appeal. I want people to be involved. I want people to be truly involved in the positive planning of their areas, uh, as well as having opportunities uh, to say what they think, uh, and people need to know that they have been properly listened to. I'll give way to Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. Very clear language. The Minister tell us what is fair about a developer having the right and a community not. Minister. One of the simple things is this. I believe in local democracy. Um, a developer, a developer, a developer does not elect councillors. Communities do elect councillors and they are the ones who are taking democratic decisions that they were elected to do. Um, I want people to be involved. This bill already brings uh, new opportunities. M Mr, Mr. Uh, Finlay, um, presiding officer, was a councillor at one point. Uh, and obviously, uh, he, like I, uh, believe that uh, councillors are, are elected to take democratic decisions. But it seems in that this case, he wants to overturn the decisions that are taken by councillors. Presiding officer, I've had enough sorry, of Mr. Mr. Finlay. Sorry, Mr. Stewart, we've got a point uh, of order. The bill... we've got, Mr. Stewart, we've got a point of order from Mr. Findlay. Point of order. Ask for point of order. Point of order, Mr. Findlay. Presiding officer, the minister may not be aware that many and many local authorities, uh, councillors do make decisions, but they are they are undem. They do make decisions, but they are undemocratically overturned by a reporter acting on behalf of the government. Mr Finlay, that's not a point of order, that's just a point. No, uh, as, as per Kevin usual. Stewart. Uh, the bill, uh, presiding officer, already brings new opportunities. People will be able to engage meaning meaningfully through development planning and local place plans. Uh, they will give a greater opportunity to genuinely influence the future of their places. Uh, and we have also committed to improve on the current arrangements for pre-application consultation on major developments following on from the bill. And we still have to discuss uh, proposals that are before us today uh, to support mediation. 
These open up planning to positive engagement at the right time to help influence development. And I am certain that, the int that introducing new rights of appeal or restricting the current right of appeal is not the way to go. In fact, uh, no. In fact, I'm convinced that this, that would be counterproductive. It would create conflict and undermine efforts to improve trust in the planning system. It would add uncertainty. It would undermine local democracy. It would be divisive and there would be no impetus to engage earlier. And crucially, restricting current appeals could deny our communities much of the investment that they need. Many of our much needed homes and the places where we work and spend our leisure time only exist because they have been approved on appeal. These amendments would have appeal rights dependent on a statement made by the planning authority as to accordance with the development plan. And as I've just been making clear, this is only half the story of how the decision is made. And it come, can come down to a matter uh, for interpretation of complex information and careful professional judgment, which may not be universally accepted. This approach also misses, um, no, I'm not gonna take an inter intervention. This approach also misses that vital ability of our planning system to be able to recognize changing circumstances. There can be very good reasons for making a decision which is not in accordance with a development plan. For example, where an emerging draft development plan contains far more current and relevant policy intent than the aging plan that it is about to replace. Or where a worthwhile development opportunity presents itself perhaps following the closure of a major employer. An additional right of appeal may, on the face of it, appear to promise a lot to communities and individuals. But I'm concerned that these claims are misguided. Uh, the reality is that an additional right of appeal will simply add time, cost, procedure, and conflict to a, an already stretched planning service, and there are better options for people. At the end of the day, an equal right of appeal, all it would mean would be reporters who have been uh, cited here today as being all bad, it seems, taking the decisions, or me taking the decisions. I would be much happier for people to become involved at the very beginning and no conflict at the end. Therefore, I would urge members to reject all of these amendments. Thank you, Minister. And can I call on Andy Whiteman to wind up in this group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll keep my remarks uh, short. Um, I think, and I say this with all sincerity, the continuing demands for equalising rights of appeal are actually designed not to increase bureaucracy or complexity, but to strengthen a plan-led system. And it's in my view that ultimately, as we move towards a plan-led system, we can abolish appeal rights completely. Now, the arguments have been well put, and I'm glad they're on the record uh, once a decade when we get to debate a planning bill. And I welcome the passionate contributions from Monica Lennon, Neil Finlay, Claudia Beamish, uh, and others. And I would just observe in relationship to the debate leading up to the 2006 Act, it, much of that debate was concerned with the fact that that Act would improve upfront engagement and community, community participation. And those arguments were used uh, to, to refute the need for any reform of the appeal system. But that has not happened. Very little, if any, of that has transpired. And therefore, the arguments that were made in 2005 remain as valid today, if not more so, than they did then. Now, Mr. Murdo Fraser said that early engagement is important, and indeed it is. But if you engage in good faith early on, only to find that a plan you've been heavily involved in developing it's upheld by the planning officials, it's upheld by those local councillors you've elected in a democracy, and then it's overturned by the minister. How do you expect people to feel? And this was the point made by, by the minister in response to Neil Finlay. He said that communities directly elect councillors, and of course they do. But we still have a situation, as I've just said, when a plan is very clear, 
when applications come in that violate it, when the officials refuse, when the councillors they've elected uphold it, and then it's overruled by the Minister on appeal. So if we don't reform the system of appeals, we are undermining trust in what will, it remains a slow process of building a plan-led system. I think I'll uh, leave my remarks there. I think it's been a useful uh, reiteration of these arguments. Clearly, uh, we've not got there, um, but I look forward to coming back in 10 years' time, see if we can make some progress then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr Whiteman. So the question is that Amendment 160 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We're going to move to a vote, and this will be a one-minute division on Amendment 160. Members, please vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 160 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 25, no, 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I uh, ask Andy Whiteman if he wishes to move Amendment 161? That is moved. The question is that Amendment 161 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 161 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 25, no, 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is not agreed. Can I call Amendment 205 in the name of Alec Rowley? Alec Rowley to move. They move, President. Thank you. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 205 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Can we move to a vote? Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 205 in the name of Alec Rowley is yes, 25, no, 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Now, before we turn to the next group, I'm going to call a short suspension for 10 minutes. Just to let members know, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to finish the uh, amendment consideration stage today. Uh, I'd like to ask the business managers if they'd all agree to meet with me just outside the chamber. Uh, and we'll have a short discussion, but we'll have a, a short suspension for 10 minutes, then we'll resume in 10 minutes' time. Parliament suspended.
Okay, colleagues, we're going to uh, resume, if that's all right, and just to, to promise resumed, just to give you a, a very quick update on where we are. Um, there potentially is up to an hour and 45 minutes or an hour and a half of business uh, still to go. Um, we're going to try and make progress. That essentially depends on you. Uh, so I would try and keep your content, your comments concise. Um, I will certainly uh, call every member that is um, uh, wishing to speak to, that, that is down to speak, in other words, moving an amendment uh, or applying to amendment. Um, but I would think about which contributions you want to make. We don't want to erode our time tomorrow. Um, we're going to try and go on to 7.30 tonight, 7.30 at which point um, we will stop consideration of amendments and we will proceed with decision time and then members' business. And I'm very conscious there are a number of events taking place in the Parliament tonight, so I know members will want to attend some of those. So that's the rough plan. Um, and we are going to proceed now with Group 30, the meaning of material considerations. Can I call Amendment 139 in the name of the Minister and the Minister to move and speak to the amendment? Uh, President Officer, material considerations play an important role in decisions on planning applications, enabling authorities to take account of the individual circumstances of each case. However, trying to predict everything that could be deemed as a material consideration for every case under the various sections of the 1997 Act is an impossible task. It could also restrict what planning authorities could consider or require them to consider issues that may not be relevant. Leaving the phrase undefined means it's for the decision maker to work out what needs to be taken into account. Ultimately, any dispute would be for the courts as whether something is or is not material is already a question of law. The Law Society welcomes this amendment as it agrees that defining the term could result in it being too restrictive or too wide to carry out any useful purpose, as Mr Whiteman accepted at stage two. A short explanation of how the principles of material considerations work is contained within, the within our development management circular. We will revisit the guidance after the bill and I move amendment 139 and I hope members will support it. Thank you, Minister. And I call Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. We need a plan-led system, one with less discretion and ambiguity. Material considerations can override the development plan and yet are nowhere uh, defined. 16, Section 16D of the Bill was introduced by me at Stage 2 and was supported by uh, the Committee. It requires that material considerations be set out in regulations to bring more certainty and strengthen the plan-led system. But it will be up to Ministers how prescri prescriptive they wish to be uh, in such uh, regulations. I see no good reason uh, for not um, uh, doing so. Amendment 139 removes Section 16D and therefore we will be opposing it. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. So, uh, does Mr. Wish to add to say, design officer. Thank you. So, the question is that Amendment 139 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yeah. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. This will be a one minute division on Amendment 139, and members may vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 139 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 86, no, 29. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Turning to group 31 on planning obligations, can I call amendment 140 in the name of the minister and the minister to move this amendment? Uh, President officer, I see merit in increasing transparency of developer contributions so that those with an interest can better and be better informed of the context around planning decisions. Yet it is crucial that the system remains proportionate and avoids placing unreasonable burdens on local authorities. 
New requirements were added at stage two for planning obligations to be both published and promoted by the planning authority and also by any other person bound by the obligation. Amendments 140 to 142 are intended to remove the requirement to promote planning obligations and require that it only be the planning authority that publishes the obligation. The planning obligation only needs published in one place and ideally should be found in the same place as details of the planning application, which are all held by the planning authority. Further, the duty to promote is unclear uh, and could be bur burdensome. And I think we can find better ways of making sure planning information is readily, readily available to the public through development management regulations and improved online systems. At stage two, amendments were agreed that would allow a planning obligation to be modified or discharged either by formal application or by simple agreements. Uh, amendments 143 to 145 require that any agreement to modify or discharge a planning obligation needs to involve all of those against whom the obligation is enforceable. It must be made in writing and must be recorded as it is binding on future owners of the property. These are positive amendments aimed at increasing the fairness and transparency of the planning obligation system and I hope members will support them. I move Amendment 140. Thank you, Minister. I call Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to uh, speak against uh, Amendment 142 in the name of the Minister. Um, and this deletes uh, part of an amendment I secured at Stage 2 around uh, planning gain obligations and uh, how they were recorded by the local authority, reported on by the local authority, and reported to the local community affected by the developer. The reason I do this um, is because uh, we all have examples in our constituencies of developers who've made largesse commitments to planning gain uh, and planning obligations, only to renege for any number of reasons um, and to very limited consequence. I have talked many times in this chamber about the example of AMA developer at Brighouse Park in Cramond, who promised after building many luxury, um, sometimes multi-million pound homes in the constituency, that uh, they were going to build a sports pavilion, then walked away after the development of the last property, claiming they had no funds left to deliver on that plan and gain. Nothing happened to them. Nothing happened to the gun. Very few people in the community actually know that that was a commitment. And indeed, local authorities, um, because the organisational memory is only as good as the councillors if they're re-elected, uh, did not happen. So I want to retain the obligation on developers to inform local communities of the expectation around planning gain so that they can hold them to account. Thank you. And can I ask the Minister if you wish to add uh, Nothing more to add, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 140 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I ask the Minister to move Amendment 141? Moved. The question is that Amendment 141 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I ask the Minister to move Amendment 142? Moved. That is moved. Are, uh, the question is that Amendment 142 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. We will move to a vote on Amendment 142. Members may vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 142 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 107, no, 11. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I invite the minister to move amendments 143 to 145 on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object if we put these questions on block? No. As good, the question is that Parliament agrees to amendments 143 to 145. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Turning now to group 32, the promotion and use of mediation, can I call amendment 146 in the name of Graeme Simpson and ask Mr Simpson to move and speak to the amendment. 
I move Amendment uh, 146. Um, we've already dealt uh, with the issue uh, of appeals uh, at some length uh, and why people feel the need uh, for a third party right of appeal. We've voted on that. I've, I've um, looked at this and I, I have um, enormous, enormous sympathy with communities who feel left out of the planning system. We've got a system where applicants of larger developments hold meaningless, poorly advertised and poorly attended so-called community meetings ahead of putting in applications. They tick a box and when most people find out what's happening, it's just it's far too late. Rouse flare, people feel let down, steamrolled, nobody really wins. And that's what's fueled the demand for equal appeal rights. And I thought, well, there must be a better way because if you get to um, the, uh, at the stage of appeal, you're at the end of the line. And surely there has to be a way to avoid all that conflict that appeals um, introduce. So I s said at stage two that I did want change at this stage. So I've been looking at mediation. I've had uh, useful uh, chats with uh, Scottish Mediation and others, including, I have to say, Homes for Scotland. And, uh, you know, they, they would not automatically be thought of as uh, enthusiasts for, for this sort of thing. But I've said to Homes for Scotland, you need to think why people want appeal rights, why, why they are frustrated. And we really, we really need to address this. So I've come up with uh, the idea of uh, mediation. Um, this is not something that we should see that we would use at the end of the process. It should be part of the process, right at the beginning. It's not something that should be used when people have fallen out. It should be used to bring people together throughout the process. And my amendment means it could be used in pre uh, preparation of local development plans. It could be used uh, in the pre-app consultation. It could also be used at the actual application stage. So pretty much every stage of the planning process. I think we need to have a better system, one where everyone is involved in shaping communities to everyone's benefit. And I would commend mediation uh, as part of that solution. Well, Alison Johnson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm, I actually I, I believe that Graham um, Simpson himself is firmly in favour of equal rights of appeal. And I understand why he feels, as he put it himself, that he has to come up with something. But I do think that this is a feeble response. We only have to have a, a mediation because it's a confrontational system. Part of the reason that it's a confrontational system is that it isn't an equitable system. If you know at the end of the day your view is just going to be dis disregarded, it's hugely frustrating. I got involved in politics about 30 years ago, trying and failing to save a local playing field. Now that particular developer used to write uh, with my you know, own name, I was a private citizen at that point, in the local press. I'm not convinced that mediation would have helped me, the local community councils who campaigned against it, the folk around me, we raised £12,000 to, to fund a QC to fight our case, and we still lost. It wasn't mediation that we needed, with the greatest of respect, Mr Simpson. It was an equal right of appeal. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this is well-meaning, but it's not good enough. Thank you. I call Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I listened very carefully to the points Graham Simpson was making, and I was struck by the fact that when we were talking about um, third party rights of appeal, which I back those amendments, although they fell. Um, there was much uh, objection to them on the basis that they would increase cost and potentially lead to greater length of time and potential complexity. And I've just listened to Graham Simpson say that we could have mediation at the point at which local development plans are being discussed and at the point at which applications are being made. And I'm questioning how much time and complexity and cost would be factored in as a consequence of that. 
beyond which I'm not entirely clear as to how a system of mediation would work in a situation where there are multiple individuals who may be affected and may choose to object, but would not necessarily be doing so on a collective basis. Many planning applications are not necessarily objected to by organised groups, but are objected to by individuals on an individual basis who may not wish to enter into mediation on a collective basis, and therefore individual mediation would presumably be required. Again, time-consuming, complex and potentially costly. So if Graham Simpson can outline how the system of mediation that he proposes would overcome some of those hurdles, I may consider voting for his amendment. But at the moment, I don't see how one can argue against third-party right of appeal on the basis of complexity, cost and time, and then propose a system of mediation which does exactly that, except at the front rather than at the back end of the process. Thank you, Mr. Donald. I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I've received correspondence in support of the amendment uh, from Scottish Mediation. I also note that in providing a gypsy traveller perspective on planning processes, the charity Article 12 in Scotland recommended that mediation should be made available for members of the gypsy traveller community so that they may gain equal access to decision making. Uh, we will look to build upon the policy and guidance uh, which is already in place. Uh, we will work with planning authorities, practitioners and others to develop this guidance uh, and I support Mr Simpson's amendment. Thank you. I call Mr Simpson to wind up if he wishes to add anything. Yeah, um, just to uh, respond to the, the comments from Alison Johnson and Mark MacDonald. Yeah, yeah, useful comments, I think, but uh, I think it's inaccurate uh, for Alison Johnson to call this a feeble response. Um, and I think, um, I'm not giving away um, I, I think um, if it, it, to understand what mediation is, you need to understand that, it, as I said earlier, it's not something that comes at the end of the process. It should be embedded throughout the process. So it's not about necessarily solving disputes. It's bringing people together and talking to them. If it's done properly, then we can have a, a much better uh, planning system. In relation to uh, Mark McDonald's comments, he's wanting details. Um, uh, the amendment doesn't set out the details. Uh, it does leave things to regulations. Um, and the reason for that is I think we need to consult on all this and bring people on board so that we have um, a system that uh, pe people agree with. So I would just uh, urge the chamber to back this because um, I think we'll end up with a better planning system if we do. Thank you very much, Mr Simpson. So the question is that Amendment 146 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now on Amendment 146. This is a one-minute division. The result of the amendment and so the result of the vote on amendment number 146 in the name of Graeme Simpson is yes 110, no 7. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. We turn now to group 33, which is monitoring compliance with conditions. I call amendment 147 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 169, Minister, to move the amendment. Uh, President Officer, Amendment 147 removes a duplication of an existing power which allows Ministers to set the scope and level of fees which authorities can charge for carrying out their functions under the Planning Act. In fact, the current legislation has already been used to introduce a similar charge for monitoring surface coal mining sites, which dem demonstrates why this spe specific pr provision is not required. The Delegated Powers Committee recommended that the duplication be removed, and I'm happy to implement that recommendation. 
Amendment 169 in the name of John Finney uh, requires planning authorities to include in their enforcement charter a statement as to how they will monitor compliance with planning permission in regard to major developments in their areas and how they will make such records available to the public. I believe that that is a helpful move that will increase transparency about the monitoring of conditions on major developments and I would encourage members to support uh, Mr Finney's amendment. I move Amendment 147. Thank you, Minister. Can I call John Finney to speak to Amendment 169? Thank you very much indeed, President Officer. I'll be uh, very brief because um, the Minister has covered most of it. This is about major developments. This is about the principle that polluter pays. Um, um, examples like the open cast in, in the past in North Ayrshire, uh, um, or I beg your pardon, East Ayrshire Council applied this, this method. It's about Section 75 agreements. It's about the public understanding that uh, there is monitoring of undertakings made by these major developers. And uh, I thank the Minister and his officials for engagement on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finney. Does the Minister wish to add anything? No, thank you. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 147 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I ask John Finney to move Amendment 169? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 169 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Turning to Group 34 training requirements, can I call Amendment 162 in the name of the Minister, Minister to move. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, all planning authorities currently provide their elected members with training, uh, but it is not mandatory for members to attend, and there is limited consistency in what is provided. Training of elected members was overwhelmingly supported in our consultation, and many stakeholders were surprised that it was not already mandatory. Uh, I was disappointed that the committee voted to remove these provisions at stage two. Uh, ensuring elected members are equipped to make decisions in a consistent manner is essential to maintaining trust in the planning system. In seeking to bring back this provision, I've refined my proposal so that it no longer specifies that an examination will, be, uh, will form part of the training requirements. I believe that there is agreement among planning stakeholders that the bill should make training a requirement for elected members making planning decisions, and I hope that members here today will support the reintroduction of this provision. I move Amendment 162. Thank you very much. I call Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, we are happy to support Amendment 162 on training for councillors. Councillors have a huge range of responsibilities and any support we can offer them is welcome. However, training must be flexible and work around councillors with a range of different backgrounds. It cannot become a barrier to having a range of voices in the planning system. And on a wider note, I do believe that all of us in here need to recognise the massive workload that we are expecting councillors to run with, whether on the planning committee, if they're on an education committee, if they're on umpteen committees, the level of workload uh, is increasingly making many of these jobs full-time jobs, and that's something this parliament needs to, I think, look at. Thank you. I call Graeme Simpson. Yeah, this, this was uh, rejected at stage two, um, largely because of the requirement for councillors to sit and exam and pass it in order to carry out their democratic duty. Um, I thought that was pretty outrageous. Um, however, um, the, the minister has uh, brought it back uh, without the requirement to sit and exam. So on that basis, we can support it. And the fact is that uh, every council um, offers training to their councillors on planning matters in any case. Thank you, Mr Simpson. Does the Minister wish Nine to add more anything? to add, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 162 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Turning to Group 35, Performance of Planning Authority Functions, can I call Amendment 163 in the name of, in the, name of the Minister and ask the Minister to move the amendment and speak to all the uh, members? President Officer, the performance of the planning system is vitally important. Uh, we are reforming planning so it better serves us all. Everyone deserves to receive a good service, from householders wanting to extend their homes to large-scale developers and to communities who want to be assured that their views are being listened to. And how planning performs even matters to people who don't engage in the service but benefit from what planning does for our communities anyway. I was disappointed that the committee chose to remove the performance provisions at stage two, which is why I've sought to return them. Throughout the parliamentary process, I've worked with members and stakeholders to build understanding and seek consensus where we can. 
Uh, I've listened to what people have said and have made a number of changes to these provisions, which now give a much clearer emphasis to supporting improvement, not just improvement of planning authorities, but of the system as a whole. Among our changes in Amendment 163, uh, we have reflected that performance reporting needs to recognise planning's contribution to positive outcomes. In Amendment 183, uh, we have rebadged the performance coordinator as an improvement coordinator and widened that role to operate in an, advise, in an advisory capacity to all involved in planning as to how everyone can play their part in a fair and effective planning system. And we have lightened the provisions in Amendment 165 to clarify the supportive nature of any assessment while ensuring necessary improvements will happen. Uh, we will continue to work closely and constructively uh, with planning authorities and wider stakeholders to develop the framework for how performance should be viewed and how the coordinator can support improved performance across the system. I ask that members now support these provisions in their new improved format and agree all, uh, and please agree all of the amendments in this group. I move Amendment 163. Thank you very much. And I call Andy Whiteman. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. All the amendments in this group were in the original bill and were removed by the committee at stage two. Today they make their unwelcome return. Um, and uh, we like them no more than we did at stage two and we're voting against them all. I note that Amendment 183 in particular uh, was lodged after the government withdrew Amendment 164 um, that drew the ire, I think, of COSLA. It's worth uh, uh, quoting from COSLA's letter to me of 10th of June um, in which they set out our stage one report's conclusions, and I quote, the committee sees no need or justification for the bill's proposals on performance and recommends that section 28 the bill be removed. We consider that the Scottish Government should continue to work collaboratively uh, with COSLA. That was in our stage one report. COSLA go on to say, since stage two, we've attempted to work collaboratively with Scottish Government, but without uh, success. Um, I'm glad that uh, Amendment 164 was withdrawn. It, included language around corruption and impropriety, uh, but nevertheless we still don't, don't see any case uh, for the amendments being brought back here at stage three. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. We will not be supporting amendments 163, 165, 166 or 185. We will be supporting amendment 183. It was a surprise and a disappointment to realise that COSLA were not consulted in the development of these amendments from the Minister whose door is, is open to everybody. The assessment of planning authorities' performance and annual reporting should be in the public interest and this means it should be seen as an opportunity to champion the interests of planners as much as the government exerting its influence. However, these amendments do not have that effect. They are framed by what feels like punitive ability of the government to intervene and direct a planning authority while planning authorities have little or no recourse or opportunity opportunity to promote their interests. COSLA's views should have been sought regarding how to do this effectively and they were not. As it stands, we support the creation of the improvement coordinator. We believe with the right consultation this could become a role which could work with the planning authorities, not against them, to bring about positive changes in the planning processes which are in the public interest. For example, promoting the role of, that planners can play in public health and equalities, sharing best practice, highlighting issues in the planning system which planners should not be held responsible for. For example, delays with the Section 75 payments and a lack of resources more generally. So I would appeal to the Minister, I hear what he said about going to work with COSLA and local authorities. He should have done so, and if he wants to get them on board with us, he needs to commit to actually listening, not just telling planning authorities and COSLA what they should and should not be doing. I call Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, we've already heard that uh, much of this was thrown out in fact, all of this was thrown out at stage two. Um, there were three elements to it. Um, one was the, um, the annual uh, performance report, which councils were, were asked to produce. So if we can take that one first, uh, which is in Amendment 163. Um, in itself, I see uh, no, no objection to that. Councils 
um, regularly report on things, and um, I don't see that as, uh, as particularly onerous. Um, then we come on to the planning coordinator, um, and this was, this was a, a, an extremely controversial role also thrown out. Uh, the government uh, at this stage um, uh, in, introduced an amendment uh, uh, on the planning, uh, uh, planning coordinator which uh, really got people's backs up. It really got COSLA's backs up. Um, I, ha I held a, uh, a meeting with, uh, it was at COSLA's uh, office with COSLA reps uh, and other, p other stakeholders uh, and it was uh, after the government had tabled their amendment, so between then and now, uh, and I asked them to tell me what their concerns were uh, in, in the bill uh, with the amendments. And we discussed this uh, at length. And where we got to was where we are now, the government's new amendment. Uh, I was happy to feed back the comments of COSLA uh, to the minister. Um, and as we all know, he has a, an open door. So, um, and I'm glad that, I am glad that he's uh, listened to what COSLA had to say, uh, because now he'll have to work with them, work with them and others to develop this role. <coughs> now, the third part is the power to appoint someone to conduct assessments of a planning authority's performance. And here we have a, um, amendments 165 and 166, and they are little changed from what was, in the bill, what was in the bill originally. And to my mind, they are far too onerous. They, they allow someone, an unnamed person, to go into a council, demand to see any, anything they like, any papers, um, and uh, you know, just, just uh, sweeping powers. And I'd, I'd, I, I was disappointed uh, that, that this remains uh, as an amendment, to be honest. I would, Rather, the minister didn't press it, but we will certainly be voting against 165 and 166. Thank you very much. And can I invite the minister to wind up on this group? Uh, very briefly, presiding officer, um, I have listened to a huge amount of the comments that have been made and have made changes along the way. One of the things which I would say to members is that performance and how we deal with performance uh, was very high in the agenda of stakeholders and members of the public. Uh, when we were consulting. Uh, and I uh, think that we have an obligation uh, to ensure um, that we deal with performance issues. I hope that members uh, will support all of the amendments uh, in my name today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that Amendment 163 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. We're going to move to a vote on Amendment 163. Members may cast their votes now. This will be a one-minute division. Amendment 163. The result of the vote on Amendment 163 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 87, no, 30. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I ask the Minister to move Amendment 183? Uh, moved, President Officer. That is moved. I now call Amendment 183A in the name of Monica Lennon. This was debated yesterday in the Qualities Issues. Monica Lennon to move? Oops. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 183A be agreed to. This was a... Yes. Thank you, Mr. Lyle. That is not agreed to. We will move to a division and members may cast their votes now. This is a 30 second vote on Amendment 183A, debated yesterday on equalities.
result of the vote on Amendment Number 183A in the name of Monica Lennon is yes, 30, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And can I... So the question now is that Amendment 183 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, we're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast the votes now on Amendment 183. The result of the vote on amendment number 183 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 106, no, 11. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I ask the Minister to move amendment 165? Uh, moved, President Officer. That is moved. The question is that amendment 165 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now on amendment 165. The result of the vote on amendment number 165 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 57, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 166 in the name of the Minister? Ask him to move. Thank you. The question is that amendment 166 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 166 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 58, no, 59. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We turn now to group 36, Chief Planning Officers, and I call amendment 170 and ask Alexander Stewart to move and speak to the amendment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move amendment 170 in my name. The role of the Chief Planning Officer is a new role created by the bill added by the way of amendments at stage two. Section 26C2 specified the role of the Chief Planning Officer is currently set out in broad terms. It is appropriate for the detailed nature of the role to vary because planning authorities, because one size may not fit all. The role of the planning authority in the running of their affairs is to be respected. However, it is also important to recognise that the current planning system is on a Scottish wide basis and therefore there is merit in there being a degree of consistency across authorities in relation to the approach of the planning matters. As such, it is appropriate that Scottish Ministers be required to issue guidance in relation to the role of the Chief Planning Officer. This will help to ensure some consistency in the role across planning authorities, likely including between the responsibilities of and functions carried out by the Chief Planning Officer. In addition, such guidance may be of help to authorities as they frame the new role for their organisations. Issuing guidance is more flexible than, out, than setting out aspects across detail uh, than in the bill. Guidance can itself create the range of circumstances that may be easily revised at primary legislation if changes required to be made or guidance requires to be updated to reflect the changing environment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I seek support and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr. Stewart, and I call on the Minister. Officer, I'm happy to support Mr Stewart's amendment on the role of the Chief Planning Officer. I believe that Scotland is leading the way by creating this statutory post and have no objection to ministers being required to produce guidance in the role. Uh, we would of course do this in close collaboration with the profession, Heads of Planning Scotland and COSLA. Thank you, Minister. Does Mr Stewart wish to add anything? No, Planning Officer. Thank you. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 170 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
No, we're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their vote now on Amendment 170. Okay. The result of the vote on amendment number 170 in the name of Alexander Stewart is yes, 91, no, 26. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call amendment 11 in the name of Rhoda Grant? And this was debated with the amendment 188 on national scenic areas. That is moved. The question is that amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote on amendment 11. Members may cast their votes now. This is on national scenic areas. Can I, sorry, the result of the vote on amendment number 11 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 88, no, 29. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call amendment 206 in the name of Rhoda Grant? Rhoda Grant to move? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that amendment 206 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we agreed? Yes. No, no we're not agreed. We'll have to move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 206 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 110, no, 6. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now we're going to turn now to group 37, which will almost certainly be the last group. Uh, I call amendment, this is noticed by Planning Authority of Applications for Listed Building Consent, and I call amendment 148 and ask the Minister to move. Uh, President Officer, section 9 of the <coughs> excuse me, Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Area Scotland Act 1997 as amended at stage two by an amendment from Gordon Lindhurst uh, would require planning authorities to notify neighbours of applications for listed consent in certain circumstances. It also requires that notification for listed building consent applications should be given to the same people in the same way as for planning applications. It's not clear that those two requirements will always be compatible, nor that it is necess necessarily appropriate. Listed building consent is a different purpose and deals with different types of work from planning consent. In particular, listed building consent is often required for internal works that have no impact on the neighbours. Planning authorities have also raised concerns about the possible impact of this requirement. No fee is charged for listed building consent, so there is at present no income to cover additional notifications. However, I'm happy to consider whether there are gaps in notification for listed building consent that we should fill, perhaps, for example, for internal works to shared buildings. What Amendment 148 does is to remove these specific requirements and instead put in place provisions so that the powers to make regulations about applications for listed building consent match those for planning applications. 
When we review the development management regulations after this bill, we will consider and consult on whether any changes also need to be made to the regulations under the Listed Buildings Act. That will allow us to make sure the requirements are appropriate for each regime. And I move Amendment 148. Thank you, Minister. No one else has asked to speak in this uh, section. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 148 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 212 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 112? Alec Rowley, to move or not move? Move. Please. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 212 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. Amendment 212. Thank you very much. The result of the vote on amendment number 212 in the name of Alex Rowley is yes 30, no 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Now, do not take this as a reason to jump up from your seats and vacate the chamber, but that is the end of consideration of amendments this afternoon. Just to give you an idea, there is roughly between three groups, uh, maybe between 30 and 45 minutes. So we will schedule time tomorrow and we'll amend business uh, tomorrow morning to consider those last amendments. Uh, however, we've got a few items to consider today, uh, this evening. The next item is consideration of business motion 17816 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that um, motion 17816 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motions 17818 and 17819 on the stage one timetable for two bills. Could I call on Graham Day to move these two motions? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Again, no one has asked to speak. The question is that motions 17818 and 17819 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next item is consideration of parliamentary bureau motion 17817 on a committee meeting at the same time as the parliament. Could I ask Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. That is moved and we come to decision time to consider that question. The question is that motion 17817 in the name of Graham Day on a committee meeting at the same time as parliament be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now that concludes decision time. We're going to move to members' business in a few moments, but I can thank... Point of order, Mr Dornan. Yes, James Dornan. No, sir. Uh, I wonder if you could give me some guidance on how a member would correct inaccuracies that they made uh, in their contributions today. Earlier on today, Monica Lennon made it clear that she believed that the minister only spoke to those that he wanted to speak to or those that agreed with his position. Now, I became convener of the local government uh, committee at the start of the stage two process. And there's not a member of that committee during that, if they're speaking honestly, wouldn't say that every meeting that the, cabinet, that the minister was at, and that was almost every week, he made it clear that he would speak to anybody about any issue regarding the planning bill. And I think for to cast aspersions in his reputation, like it was done earlier today, should be corrected by Monica Lennon. Okay. Can I thank Mr Dornan for the advance notice of the point of order? It was very similar to the one raised by Rachel Hamilton earlier, and that is that there is a correction procedure, either through the official report or through members making statement. It is up to the member concerned to make a decision as to whether it needs to be corrected. I thank the Minister member for giving me advance notice. And we'll now just uh, move to members' business. We'll just take a few moments. We're not going to suspend, but we'll take a few moments for the member, member and the ministers to change seats. And can I thank members for their work today?